Boy's Life by Robert McCammon Corey, wake up, son, it's time. I let him pull me up from the dark cavern of sleep, and I opened my eyes and looked up at him. He was already dressed in his dark brown uniform with his name, Tom, written in white letters across his breast pocket. I smelled bacon and eggs, and the radio was playing softly in the kitchen. A pan rattled, and glasses clinked. It's time, my father said, and he switched on the lamp beside my bed and left me squinting with the last images of a dream fading in my brain. The sun wasn't up yet. It was mid-March, and a chill wind blew through the trees beyond my window. I could feel the wind by putting my hand against the glass. Spring had sprung a couple of days before, but this year winter had sharp teeth and nails, and he clung to the south like a white cat. We hadn't had snow. We never had snow, but the wind was chill, and it blew hard from the lungs of the pole. Mom called from the kitchen. Heavy sweater. Hear? I hear. I got my green heavy sweater from my dresser. My blue jeans had patches on the knees like badges of courage marking encounters with the barbed wire and gravel. My flannel shirt was red enough to stagger a bull. My socks were white as dove wings and my kids midnight black. My mom was colorblind, and my dad thought checks went with plaid. I was all right. It's funny sometimes when you look at the people who brought you into this world and you see yourself so clearly in them. You realize that every person in the world is a compromise of nature. I had my mother's small bone frame and her wavy dark brown hair, but my father had given me his blue eyes and his sharp bridged nose. I had my mother's long fingered hands, artist's hands, she used to tell me when I fretted that my fingers were so skinny, and my dad's thick eyebrows and the small cleft in his chin. I wished that some nights I could go to sleep and awaken resembling a man's man like Stuart Whitman and Cimarron Strip or Clint Walker and Cheyenne. But the truth of it was that I was a skinny, gawky kid of average height and looks, and I could blend into wallpaper by closing my eyes and holding my breath. In my fantasies, though, I tracked lawbreakers along with the cowboys and detectives who paraded past us nightly on our television set. And out in the woods that came up behind our house, I helped Tarzan call the lions and shot Nazis down in a solitary war. I had a small group of friends guys like Johnny Wilson, Davy Ray Callan, and Ben Sears. But I wasn't what you might call popular. Sometimes I got nervous talking to people, and my tongue got tangled, so I stayed quiet. My friends and I were about the same in size, age, and temperament. We avoided what we could not fight, and we were all pitiful fighters. On that morning before the sun, as I sat eating my breakfast with my dad and mom in our house on Hilltop Street, the year was 1964. There were great changes in the winds of Earth, things of which I was unaware. All I knew at that moment was that I needed another glass of orange juice and that I was going to help my dad on his route before he took me to school. So when breakfast was over and the dishes were cleared after I had gone out into the cold to say good morning to Rebel and feed him his gravy train, Mom kissed both Dad and me. I put on my fleece-lined jacket and got my school books and off we went in the coffee old pickup truck. And there was Zephyr before us, the town, quiet in its dreaming, the moon a white sickle in the sky. A few lights were on, not many. It wasn't five o'clock yet. The traffic lights, all four of them at what might be called major intersections, blinked yellow in a steady accord. To the east, a stone bridge with brooding gargoyles crossed the wide hollow where the river ran. To the west, the highway wound into the wooded hills and on toward other towns. A railroad track cut across Zephyr to the north, right through the Bruton area, where all the black people lived. In the south was the public park, where a band shell stood and a couple of baseball diamonds had been cut into the earth. Farther south, Route 10 left Zephyr's limits and wound like a black cottonmouth past swampy woods, a trailer park, and Saxon's Lake, which shelved into unknown depths. Dad turned us onto Merchant Street, and we drove through the center of Zephyr, where the stores were. There was Dollar's Barbershop, the stag shop for men, 
the Zephyr Feeds and Hardware Store, the Piggly Wiggly Grocery, the Woolworth Store, the Lyric Theater, and other attractions along the sidewalked thoroughfare. Then Dad crossed the railroad track, drove another two miles, and turned into a gate that had a sign above it, Green Meadows Dairy. The milk trucks were at the loading dock, getting filled up. Sometimes when my father had an especially busy schedule, he asked me to help him with his deliveries. I liked the silence and stillness of the mornings. I liked the world before the sun. I liked finding out what different people ordered from the dairy. My dad went over a checklist with the foreman, a big crew-cut man named Mr. Bowers, and then Dad and I started loading our truck. Here came the bottles of milk, the cartons of fresh eggs, buckets of cottage cheese, and Green Meadows' special potato and bean salads. Everything was still cold from the ice room, and the milk bottles sparkled with frost under the loading dock's lights. Their paper caps bore the face of a smiling milkman, and the words, Good for you. As we were working, Mr. Bowers came up and watched with his clipboard at his side and his pen behind his ear. You think you'd like to be a milkman, Corey? I said I might, and Mr. Bowers nodded. The world will always need milkmen. Isn't that right, Tom? Right as rain, Dad answered. This was an all-purpose phrase he used when he was only half listening. Then Dad climbed behind the big spoked wheel. I got into the seat next to him, and he turned the key, and the engine started and we backed away from the loading dock with our creamy cargo. Ahead of us, the moon was sinking down, and the last of the stars hung on the lip of night. Then Dad asked me, I guess we've never talked about what you want to do, have we? No, sir. Well, I don't think you ought to be a milkman just because that's what I do. See, I didn't start out to be a milkman. Granddaddy Jaybird wanted me to be a farmer like him. Grandmama Sarah wanted me to be a doctor. Can you imagine that? He glanced at me and grinned. Me, a doctor? Dr. Tom? No, sir, that wasn't for me. What did you start out to be? I asked. My dad was quiet for a while. He seemed to be thinking this question over in a deep place. It occurred to me that maybe no one had ever asked him this before. He gripped the spoked wheel with his grown-up hands and negotiated the road that unwound before us in the headlights, and then he said, First man on Venus, or rodeo rider, or a man who can look at an empty space and see in his mind the house he wants to build there, right down to the last nail and shingle. Or oh, a detective. He made a little laughing noise in his throat. But the dairy needed another milkman, so here I am. Being a detective would be good. I'd get to solve mysteries and stuff like the Hardy Boys, I said. My dad agreed. Yeah, that'd be good. You never know how things are going to turn out, though, and that's the truth. You aim for one place, sure as an arrow, but before you hit the mark, the wind gets you. I don't believe I ever met one person who became what they wanted to be when they were your age. He pointed. Here's our first stop. That first house must have had children in it, because they got two quarts of chocolate milk to go along with their two quarts of plain milk. Then we were off again, driving through the streets where the only sounds were the wind and the barking of early dogs. And we stopped on Shantuck Street, to deliver buttermilk and cottage cheese to somebody who must have liked things sour. Dad said he had some customers down south near Saxon's Lake, and then he'd swing back up so we could finish the rest of the street deliveries before my school bell rang. He drove us past the park and out of Zephyr, and the forest closed in on either side of the road. It was getting on towards six o'clock. To the east, over the hills of Pine and Kudzu, the sky was beginning to lighten. The wind shoved its way through the trees like the fist of a bully. My dad picked up the conversation again. College. You ought to go to college, it seems to me. Do detectives have to go to college? <laughs> I reckon they do if they want to be professional about it. If I'd gone to college, I might have turned out to be that man who builds a house in empty space. You never know what's ahead for you. And that's the truth, he was about to say. But he never finished it because we came around a wooded bend and a brown car jumped out of the forest right in front of us and Dad yelped like he was hornet stung as his foot punched the brake. The brown car went past us as Dad whipped the wheel to the left and I saw that car go off Route 10 and down the embankment on my right. Its lights weren't on, but there was somebody sitting behind the wheel. The car's tires tore through the underbrush and then it went over a little cliff of red rock and down into the dark. Water splashed up and I realized... The car had just plunged into Saxon's lake.
He went into the water, I shouted. Dad stopped the milk truck, pulled up the handbrake, and jumped out into the roadside weeds. As I climbed out, Dad was already running toward the lake. The wind whipped and whirled around us, and Dad stood there on the red rock cliff. By the faint, pinkish light, we could see the car wallowing in the water, huge bubbles bursting around its trunk. Dad shouted with his hands cupped around his mouth, Hey! Get out of there! Everybody knew Saxon's Lake was deep as sin, and when that car went down into the inky depths, it was gone for good and ever. Hey! Get out! Dad shouted again. But whoever was behind the wheel didn't answer. Dad shot me a frantic look as he took off his shoes. I think he's been knocked cold. The car was starting to turn onto its passenger side, and there was an awful howling sound coming from it that must have been the rush of water pouring into the car. Dad said, Stand back. I did, and he leaped into the lake. He was a strong swimmer. He reached the car in a few powerful strokes, and he saw the driver's window was open. Get out, he hollered. But the driver just sat there. Dad clung to the door, reached in, and grabbed the driver's shoulder. It was a man, and he wore no shirt. The flesh was white and cold, and my dad felt his own skin crawl. The man's head lolled back, his mouth open. He had short-cropped, blonde hair. His eyes sealed shut with black bruises. His face swollen and malformed from the pressures of a savage beating. Around his throat was knotted a copper piano wire, the thin metal pulling so tightly that the flesh had split open. Oh, Jesus, my dad whispered, treading water. The car lurched and hissed. The head lolled forward over the chest again, as if in an attitude of prayer. Water was rising up over the driver's bare knees. My dad realized the driver was naked, not a stitch on him. Something glinted on the steering wheel, and he saw handcuffs that secured the man's right wrist to the inner spoke. My dad had lived thirty-four years. He'd seen dead men before, but this one was different. This one was the face of murder. The car was going down. As its hood sank, its tail fins started rising. The body behind the wheel shifted again, and my father saw something on the man's shoulder. A blue patch, there against the white. Not a bruise, no. A tattoo. It was a skull, with wings swept back from the bony temples. A great burst of bubbles blew out of the car as more water rushed in. The lake would not be denied. It was going to claim its toy and tuck it away in a secret drawer. As the car began to slide down into the murk, the suction grabbed my father's legs and pulled him under, and standing on the red rock cliff, I saw his head disappear, and I shouted, Dad! as panic seized my guts. Underwater, he fought the lake's muscles. The car fell away beneath him, and as his legs thrashed for a hold in the liquid tomb, more bubbles rushed up and broke him loose, and he climbed up their silver staircase toward the attic of air. I saw his head break the surface. Dad! Come on back, Dad! I'm all right. I'm coming in. Dad's voice was shaky. He began dog paddling toward the shore, his body suddenly as weak as a squeezed-out rag. The lake continued to erupt where the car disturbed its innards, like something bad being digested. Dad couldn't get up the red rock cliff, so he swam to a place where he could clamber up on kudzu vines and stones. A turtle the size of a dinner plate skittered past him and submerged with a perplexed snort. I glanced back toward the milk truck. I don't know why, but I did. And I saw a figure standing in the woods across the road just standing there, wearing a long, dark coat. Its folds moved with the wind. Maybe I'd felt the eyes of whoever was watching me as I'd watched my father swim to the sinking car. I shivered a little, bone cold, and then I blinked a couple of times, and where the figure had been was just windswept woods again. My dad called out, Corey, give me a hand up, son. I went down to the muddy shore and gave him as much help as a cold, scared child could. Then his feet found solid earth, and he pushed the wet hair back from his forehead. His voice was urgent. Gotta get to a phone. There was a man in that car. 
went straight down to the bottom. I pointed toward the woods on the other side of Route 10. I saw... I saw... Somebody was... Come on, let's go! My father was already crossing the road with his sturdy, soggy legs, his shoes in his hand. I jump-started my own legs and followed him as close as a shadow, and my gaze returned to where I'd seen that figure. But nobody was there. Nobody. Nobody at all. Dad started the milk truck's engine and switched on the heater. His teeth were chattering, and in the gray twilight his face looked as pale as candle wax. Damnedest thing, he said, and this shocked me because he never cursed in front of me. Handcuffed to the wheel he was. Handcuffed. My God, that fellow's face was all beat up. He turned the heater up, and then he drove south toward the nearest house. Dad used the phone there while I waited in the truck. Then we drove back to where the car had gone in. Saxon's Lake was streaked with blue and purple in the morning light. Dad pulled the milk truck off onto a dirt road. The road, both of us realized, was where the car had come from. We sat and waited for the sheriff as the sunlight strengthened and the sky turned azure. I was about to open my mouth to tell Dad about the figure I'd seen in the woods when a black and white Ford with a bubble light on top and the town seal of Zephyr on the driver's door rounded the corner and slowed to a stop near the milk truck. Sheriff Amory, whose first name was J.T., standing for Junior Talmadge, got out, and Dad walked over to meet him. Sheriff Amory was a thin, tall man whose long-jawed face made me think of a picture I'd seen, Ichabod Crane trying to outrace the headless horseman. He had big hands and feet and a pair of ears that might have shamed Dumbo. If his nose had been any larger, he would have made a dandy weather vane. He wore his sheriff's star pinned to the front of his hat, and underneath it his dome was almost bald, except for a wreath of dark brown hair. He pushed his hat back up on his shiny forehead as he and my dad talked at the lake's edge. I watched my father's hand motions as he showed Sheriff Amory where the car had come from and where it had gone. Then they both looked out toward the lake's still surface, and I knew what they were thinking. That car might have sunken to the center of the earth. Even the snapping turtles that lived along the lake shore couldn't get far enough down to ever see that car again. Whoever the driver had been, he was sitting in the dark right now, with mud in his teeth. I heard Sheriff Amory's quiet voice. Handcuffed. That was so he wouldn't float out, I reckon. He tapped his lower lip with a forefinger. Well, I believe we got a murder on our hands, don't you? Dad nodded grimly. If it wasn't, I don't know what murder is. As they talked, I got out of the milk truck and wandered over to where I thought I'd seen that person watching me. I walked back and forth along the line of trees. Beyond it, the woods deepened and swampy ground took over. I found nothing. I returned to the milk truck and waited for my dad. The sun was up, good and proper now, lighting the world. I realized I had brought mud back into the milk truck. It was smeared all over my kids. I looked at the soles and the earth I had collected. On the bottom of my left kid was a small green feather. The green feather went into my pocket. From there, it found its way into a white owl cigar box in my room, along with my collection of old keys and dried-up insects. I closed the box lid, placed the box in a drawer, and slid the drawer shut. The more I thought about seeing that figure at the edge of the woods, the more I thought I'd been wrong, that my eyes had been scared from seeing Dad sink underwater as the car went down. Several times, I started to tell Dad about it, but something else got in the way. Mom threw a gut-busting fit when she found out he jumped into the lake. She was so mad at him, she sobbed as she yelled. You could have drowned. You could have hit your head on a rock and drowned. That lake's full of cottonmouths. You could have swum right into a nest of them. Worrying was my mother's way. To my mother, the world was a vast quilt whose stitches were always coming undone. Her worrying somehow worked like a needle, tightening those dangerous seams. If she could imagine events through to their worst tragedy then she seemed to have some kind of control over them. My father could throw up a fistful of dice to make a decision, but my mother had an agony for every hour. I guess they balanced. 
as two people who love each other should. Anyway, I went to school that day, and at the first opportunity, told Davy Ray Callan, Johnny Wilson, and Ben Sears what had happened. By the time the school bell rang and I walked home, the news was moving across Zephyr like a crackling wildfire. Murder was the word of the hour. My parents were fighting off the phone calls. Everybody wanted to know the grisly details. I went outside to ride my rusted old bike and lead Rebel for a chase in the woods. And it came to me that maybe one of those people who called already knew the details. Maybe one of them was just trying to find out if he'd been seen or what Sheriff Amory knew. The days passed, warming into the heart of spring. Sheriff Amory found no one missing from Zephyr or from any of the surrounding communities. A front-page article in the weekly Adams Valley Journal brought forth no new information. Sheriff Amory and two of his deputies, some of the firemen, and a half-dozen volunteers got out on the lake in rowboats and dragged nets back and forth, but they only came up with an angry catch of snapping turtles and cottonmouths. Saxon's Lake used to be Saxon's Quarry back in the twenties, before the steam shovels had broken into an underground river that would not be capped or shunted aside. Estimates of its depth ranged from three hundred to five hundred feet. There wasn't a net on earth that could scoop that sunken car back to the surface. The sheriff came by one evening for a talk with Dad and Mom, and they let me sit in on it. The sheriff rested his hat on his lap, and his nose threw a shadow. Whoever did it must have backed that car under the dirt road facing the lake. We found the tire marks, but the footprints were all scuffed over. The killer must have had something wedged against the gas pedal. Just before you rounded the bend, he released the handbrake, slammed the door, and jumped back, and the car took off across Route 10. Whoever it was must know these parts, because they had to know how deep that lake is. Except they didn't know you were going to be there, of course. If you hadn't been there, the car would have gone into the lake, sunk, and nobody would have ever known it happened. That's the best I can come up with. So where does that leave us? The sheriff pondered my dad's question. He spread his big hands out and looked at his fingers. Tom, we have a real strange situation here. We got tire marks, but no car. You say you saw a dead man handcuffed to the wheel and a wire around his throat, but we don't have a body, and we're not likely to recover one. Nobody's missing from town, nobody's missing in the whole area, and I can't find anybody who's seen a fellow with a tattoo like the one you've described. Sheriff Amory looked at me, then my mother, and then back to my dad with his cold black eyes. You know that riddle, Tom, the one about a tree falling in the woods, and if there's nobody around to hear it, does it make a noise? Well, if there's no body, and then no one's missing anywhere that I can tell, was there a murder or not? I know what I saw. Are you doubting my word, J.T.? No, oh, I didn't say that. I'm only saying I can't do anything more till we get a murder victim. I need a name, Tom. I need a face. Without identification, I don't even know where to start. My dad frowned. So in the meantime, somebody who killed another man is walking around as free as you please and doesn't have to be scared of getting caught any time soon. Is that it? Yep. Yeah. That about sums it up. Of course, Sheriff Amory promised he'd keep working on it and that he'd call around the state for information on missing persons. Sooner or later, he said, somebody would have to ask after the man who had gone down in the lake. When the sheriff had gone, my father went out to sit on the front porch by himself with the light off and he sat there alone, past the time Mom told me to get ready for bed. That was the night my father's cry awakened me in the dark. I sat up in bed. My nerves jangled. I could hear Mom talking to Dad through the wall. It's all right. It was a bad dream, just a bad dream. Everything's all right. Dad was quiet for a long time. I heard water running in the bathroom, then the squeak of their bed springs, and Mom's voice again. You won't tell me about it? Dad sighed. I could imagine him there in the darkened bedroom, his hands pressed to his face. Then I heard his voice. I had another nightmare about that man in the car. I figured so. I was looking at him in that car, with his face all beat to a pulp and his throat strangled with a wire. I saw the handcuff on his wrist and the tattoo on his shoulder. The car was going down, and then... Then his eyes opened. I shivered. 
I could see it myself, and my father's voice was almost a gasp. He looked at me, right at me. Water poured out of his eye holes. He opened his mouth, and his tongue was as black as a snake's head. And then he said, Come with me. Come with me down in the dark. The car, the car started sinking faster and faster, and I tried to break loose, but he wouldn't let me go, and he said, Come with me, come with me down in the dark. And then the lake closed over my head, and I couldn't get away from it, and I opened my mouth to scream, but the water filled it up. Oh, Jesus, Rebecca. Oh, Jesus. It wasn't real. Listen to me, it was only a bad dream, and everything's all right now. No, it's not. And this is the worst thing. Rebecca, this is what's grinding inside of me. Whoever did it had to be a local. Had to be. Whoever did it knew how deep the lake is. He knew when that car went in there, the body was gone. Rebecca, whoever did this thing might be somebody who sits in our pew at church. Somebody we buy groceries or clothes from. Somebody we've known all our lives or thought we knew. That scares me like I've never been scared before. You know why? Dad was silent for a moment, and I could imagine the way the pulse throbbed at his temple. Because if it's not safe here, it's not safe anywhere in this world. I was glad I wasn't in that room and that I couldn't see his face. This thing had hurt my father in a place deeper than the bottom of Saxon's Lake. I think my father had always believed all people were good, even in their secret souls. This thing had cracked his foundations, and it occurred to me that the murderer had handcuffed my father to that awful moment in time, just as the victim had been handcuffed to the wheel. I closed my eyes and prayed for Dad that he could find his way out of the dark. March went out like a lamb, but the murderer's work was unfinished. Things settled down, as things will. April brought rain, and more rain. Easter was coming, and Mom said she hoped the rain didn't spoil the Merchant Street Easter Parade on Saturday. Early on the morning of Good Friday, starting around six o'clock or so, there was always another parade of sorts in Zephyr. It began in Bruton, at a small frame house painted purple, orange, red, and sunburst yellow. A procession of black men, in black suits, white shirts, and ties, made their way from this house, with a number of women and children in somber clothing following behind. Two of the men carried drums and beat a slow, steady rhythm to time the paces. The procession wound its way across the railroad track and along Merchant Street, the center of town, and no one spoke to each other. Since this was an annual event, many of Zephyr's white population emerged from their houses to stand along the street and watch. My mother was one of them, though my dad was already at work by that time of the morning. I usually went with her because I grasped the significance of this event just as everyone else did. The three black men who led the way carried burlap bags. Around their necks, dangling down over their ties, were necklaces of amber beads, chicken bones, and the shells of small river mussels. On this particular Good Friday, the streets were wet and the rain drizzled down, but the members of the black parade carried no umbrellas. They spoke to no one on the sidewalks, nor to anyone who happened to be so rude as to speak to them. Bringing up the very rear of the procession, even behind the women and children, was a spindly man wearing a black tuxedo and a top hat. He carried a small drum, and his black-gloved hand beat it to mark the rhythm. It was this man and his wife, whom many had come out on the chilly, rainy morning to see. The wife would arrive later. He walked alone, his face downcast. We called him the Moon Man because we didn't know his real name. He was very old, but exactly how old it was impossible to say. He was very rarely seen outside of Bruton, except on this occasion, as was his wife. Either a birth defect or a skin malady had affected one side of his long, narrow face, turning it pale yellow, while the other side remained deep ebony, the two halves merging in a war of splotches down his forehead, the bridge of his elegant nose and his white-bearded chin. The Moon Man, an enigma, 
had two watches on each wrist and a gilded crucifix the size of a ham hock hanging on a chain around his neck. He was, we presumed, the parade's official timekeeper, as well as one of its royal personages. The parade continued, step by steady step, through Zephyr to the Gargoyle Bridge over the Tecumseh River. Once the three men with the burlap bags reached the center of the bridge, they stopped and stood like black statues. In a moment, a Pontiac Bonneville, covered hood to trunk with gleaming plastic rhinestones, was driven slowly along Merchant Street from Bruton, following the parade's path. When it arrived at the center of the Gargoyle Bridge, the driver got out and opened the rear door, and the moon man took his wife's wrinkled hand and helped her to her feet. The lady had arrived. She was as thin as a shadow and just as dark. She had a cotton cloud of white hair, her neck long and regal, her shoulders frail but unbowed. She wore a simple black dress with a silver belt, white shoes, a white pillbox hat with a veil, and white gloves to her bony elbows. As the moon man helped her from the car, the driver opened an umbrella and held it over her royal ancient head. The lady, it was said, had been born in the year 1858. That made her 106 years old. My mom said the lady had been a slave in Louisiana and had run away with her mama into the swamp before the Civil War. The lady had grown up in a colony of lepers, escaped convicts and slaves, in the bayou below New Orleans, and that was where she'd learned everything she knew. The lady was a queen, and Bruton was her kingdom. No one outside Bruton, and no one inside Bruton, as far as I understood, knew her by any name but the lady. It suited her. She was elegance through and through. Someone gave her a bell. She stood looking down at the sluggish brown river, and she began to slowly swing the bell back and forth. I knew what she was doing. My mom did, too. Everyone who watched did. The lady was calling the river's monster up from its mansion of mud. I had never seen the beast that was called Old Moses. One night, when I was nine years of age, I did think I heard Old Moses calling after a heavy rain, when the air itself was as thick as water. It was a low rumble, like the deepest bass note from a church's pipe organ. So deep your bones hear it before your ears do. It went up into a hoarse roar that made the town's dogs go crazy, and then the noise was gone. It hadn't lasted but maybe five or six seconds. The next day, that noise was the talk of the town. My folks said it must have been the train passing through, but we didn't find out until later that the rain had washed away a section of track more than twenty miles from Zephyr, and the freight to Birmingham hadn't even run that night. Such things make you wonder. The lady rang the bell, her arm working like a metronome. She began to chant and sing, in a voice surprisingly clear and loud. The chant was all African words, which I understood about as much as I grasped nuclear physics. She never once said the name, Old Moses. She kept saying, Dambala, Dambala, Dambala. And then her voice would sail upward in an African song again. At last, she ceased ringing the bell, and she lowered it to her side. Then she stepped back, and the three men with the burlap bags stood at the edge of the gargoyle bridge. They opened the bags and brought out objects wrapped up in butcher's paper and tape. They began to unwrap the gory feast, and as they did, they threw the steaks, briskets, and beef ribs down into the swirling brown water. A whole plucked chicken went into the river, too, along with chicken intestines poured from a plastic jar. The last thing in was a beef heart bigger than a wrestler's fist. It splashed like a red stone, and then the three men folded up their burlap bags, and the lady stepped forward again, watching her footing on the blood that dripped onto the pavement. It occurred to me that an awful lot of Sunday dinners had just gone into the drink. 
Dambala, 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 the lady chanted once more. She stood there for maybe four or five minutes, motionless as she watched the river move beneath the bridge. Then she breathed a long sigh, and I saw her face beneath the veil as she turned toward her rhinestone Pontiac again. She was frowning, whatever she had seen or had not seen. She wasn't too happy about it. She got into the car. The moon man climbed in after her. The driver closed the door and slid behind the wheel. The procession began to go back the route it had come. Usually by this time there was a lot of laughing and talking, and people would stop to speak to the white faces along the way. On this particular Good Friday, however, the lady's somber mood had carried, and no one seemed to feel much like laughing. I knew exactly what the ritual was all about. Everybody in town did. The lady was feeding old Moses his annual banquet. When this had started, I didn't know. It had been going on long before I was born. You might think, as Reverend Blessed at the Freedom Baptist Church did, that it was pagan and of the devil and should be outlawed by the mayor and town council. But enough white people believed in old Moses to override the preacher's objections. It was like carrying a rabbit's foot or throwing salt over your shoulder if you happened to spill any. These things were part of the grain and texture of life. And better do them than not, just in case God's ways were more mysterious than we Christians could grasp. On the following day the rain fell harder, and thunderclouds rolled over Zephyr. The Merchant Street Easter Parade was cancelled, much to the dismay of the Arts Council and the Commerce Club. Easter morning arrived, cloaked in gloom. As we did every Easter, we crowded into the pickup truck and drove to the Zephyr First Methodist Church to hear about the empty tomb. The white church on Cedarvine Street, between Bonner and Shantick, was filling up by the time we parked. We walked through the sloppy mist toward the light that streamed through the church's stained-glass windows, all the polish getting soaked off our shoes. People were shedding their raincoats and closing their umbrellas at the front door, beneath the overhanging eaves. Come in, handsome. Come in, flowers. Watch your step there, noodles. Good Easter morning to you, sunshine. That was Dr. Lysander, who served as the church's greeter. He had never missed a Sunday, as far as I knew. Dr. Franz Lysander was the veterinarian in Zephyr, and it was he who had cured Rebel of the worms last year. He was a Dutchman, and though he still had a heavy accent, he and his wife Veronica, Dad had told me, had come from Holland long before I was born. He was in his mid-fifties, stood about five-eight, was broad-shouldered and bald-headed, and had a neatly trimmed gray beard. He wore natty three-piece suits, always with a bow tie and a lapel carnation, and he made up names for people as they entered the church. Good morning, peach pie, he said to my smiling mother. Then to my father, with a knuckle-popping handshake. Raining hard enough for you, Thunderbird? And to me, with a squeeze of the shoulder and a grin that shot light off a silver front tooth. Step right in, Bronco. Once we were inside, I asked Dad, Hear what Dr. Lysander called me? Bronco. Getting a new christening for a day was always a highlight of church. The sanctuary was steamy, though the wooden ceiling fans revolved. The glass sisters were up front, playing a piano and organ duet. They were the perfect definition of the word strange. While not identical twins, the two spinster sisters were close enough to be slightly skewed mirrors. They were both long and bony. Sonia, with piled-high whitish-blonde hair, and Katharina, with piled-high blondish-white hair. They both wore thick, black-framed glasses. Sonia played the piano and not the organ, while Katharina did vice versa. Depending on who you asked, the glass sisters, who seemed to always be nagging each other but lived together on Shantuck Street in a house that looked like gingerbread, were either 58, 62, or 65. The strangeness was completed by their wardrobes. Sonia wore only blue in all its varying shades, while Katharina was a slave to green, which brought about the inevitable. Sonia was referred to by us kids as Miss Blue Glass, 
and Katharina was called. You guessed it. But, strange or not, they sure could play up a storm. The pews were packed almost solid. The place looked and felt like a hothouse where exotic hats had bloomed. Because of the rain, the windows were shut tight, and the air was really getting muggy. The choir filed in, wearing their purple robes. Before the first song was finished, I was sweating under my shirt. We stood up, sang a hymn, and sat down. Plump, round-faced, Reverend Richmond Lavoy stepped behind the pulpit and began to talk about what a glorious day it was with Jesus risen from the dead and all. As Reverend Lavoy spoke, his voice competed with the thunder of heaven. He asked everyone to pray. I lowered my head and squeezed my eyes shut. After the prayer was over, we sang another hymn. Announcements were made, and visitors welcomed. The offering plate was passed around. I put in the dollar Dad had given me for this purpose. The choir sang, with the glasses playing piano and organ. Then Reverend Lavoy stood up again to deliver his Easter sermon. And that was when Fire Chief Jack Marchette, who was also head of civil defense, burst into the church and ran down the center aisle to the pulpit. The Reverend looked stunned as Chief Marchette approached. Reverend, I'm terribly sorry to interrupt, but we've got an emergency. Chief Marchette, what? The dams burst at Lake Holman. We're calling everybody together at the courthouse, now. People began to move quick. Reverend Lavoy made reassuring noises as his flock headed out the door, but I sensed a rising tension. The last flood had been when I was five, and it hadn't done a whole lot of damage except stir up the swamp snakes. I knew, though, from my reading about Zephyr, that in 1938 the river had flooded the streets to the depth of four feet, and in 1930 the spring flood had risen almost to the rooftops of some of the houses in Bruton. So my town had a history of being waterlogged, and with all the rain we and the rest of the South had been getting, there was no telling what might happen this year. Everybody filed out of church, sweeping along in a sea of worried murmurings. Mom, Dad, and I jammed into the pickup truck and headed for the courthouse. Mayor Swope, tall and thin, with his perpetual briar pipe puffing like a locomotive, led a hasty meeting along with Chief Marchette. Most of Zephyr was packed into the main meeting room and the mayor told everybody that Mr. Vanderkamp was opening up the hardware store and handing out shovels and sandbags so we could start building a dam between Bruton and the river. We went home and changed clothes, and then drove to the Bruton Recreation Center, where people were parking on the public basketball court. Bruton's narrow streets were already awash. On the wooded riverbank, most of the residents of Bruton were laboring in knee-deep water. A wall of mud was going up, but the river was hungry. Fog swirled over the rising water. Lightning flashed and thunder boomed. I heard the urgent cries of people to work faster and harder. My mother's hand gripped mine and held on tightly while Dad went on ahead to join a group of Bruton men who were filling up little burlap bags and tossing them down to other rain-soaked men. The water rose. My belt buckle submerged. I sensed it before I saw it. A figure stood to my left, watching me. Whoever it was wore a long raincoat, his hands in his pockets. The wind shrilled in off the thunderstorm and moved the wet folds of the coat, and I almost choked on my heart, because I remembered the figure in the woods opposite Saxon's Lake. Then whoever it was started wading past my mother and me toward the laborers, it was a tall figure, a man, I presumed, and he moved with purposeful strength. The man wore a drenched and dripping fedora that obscured his face. The band of that hat was secured by a silver disc the size of a half dollar, and a small decorative feather stuck up from it, a feather dark with wet, but a feather with a definite glint of green. My mind raced. Might there have been two green feathers in that hat band before the wind had plucked one out? I pulled my hand free from my mother's, and I went after him. She called after me. Corey? Corey, take my hand! I heard, but I didn't listen. The water swirled around me. I kept going. I had to see his face. Mister? I called. It was too noisy. What with the rain and the river and the working, he couldn't hear. 
I felt the Tecumseh's currents pulling at my shoes. I was sunken waist-deep in cold murk. The man was heading toward the riverbank where my dad was. I saw him pull something from his pocket. Something metallic glinted in it. Something with a sharp edge. My heart shuddered. The man in the green feathered hat was on his way to the riverbank for an appointment with my father. It was an appointment, perhaps, that he'd been planning ever since Dad dove in after the sinking car. With all this commotion, all this noise, and in all this watery dark, might not the man in the green feathered hat find a chance to drive the blade into my father's back? He was stronger against the current than I. He was pulling away from me. I lunged forward, fighting the river. And that was when my feet slipped out from under me and I went down, the muddy water closing over my head. I reached up, trying to grab something to hold on to. There was nothing solid, and I couldn't get my feet planted. My mind screamed that I'd never be able to draw a breath again. I splashed and wallowed. And then somebody had gripped me and was lifting me up as the muddy water oozed from my face and hair. A man said, I've got you, you all right? Corey, what's wrong with you, boy? Are you crazy? That was my mother's voice, rising to new heights of terror. I believe he stepped in a hole, Rebecca. The man set me down. I was still standing waist-deep in water, but at least my feet were touching earth. I wiped clots of mud from my eyes and looked up at Dr. Curtis Parrish, a heavy-set man, about forty-eight or forty-nine years old, with the same hands that had scooped me up from the hole at my feet. Dr. Parrish had delivered me from my mother's womb. He wore a gray raincoat and a rain hat. The hat had no band. Therefore, it had no silver disc and no green feather. I turned around, looking for the figure I'd been trying to reach. But he had merged with the other people nearer the river's edge. He and the knife he'd drawn from his pocket. Where's Dad? I've got to find Dad. I was working up to another fever pitch. Dr. Parrish took hold of my shoulders. In one hand, he held a flashlight. Whoa, whoa, settle down. Tom's right over there. He pointed toward a group of muddied men. I saw my father over there, working between a black man and Mr. Yarbrough. See him? Yes, sir. Again, I searched for the mysterious figure. Vanished. Mom scolded me. Corey, don't you run away from me like that. You scared me almost to death. She took my hand again with a grip of iron. Dr. Parrish said to Mom, I heard from Chief Marchette a little while ago that they've opened up the school gym. They're bringing in some cots and blankets. Most of the women and children are going over there to stay since the water's getting so high. Is that where we ought to go then? I think it'd be the wisest thing. There's no use you and Corey standing out here in this mess. Dad won't know where we are, I protested, still thinking of the green feather and the knife. I let him know. Tom would want you both in a safe place, and I'll tell you the truth, Rebecca. The way this is going, we'll be catching catfish in the attics before morning. We turned away from the swollen Tecumseh and started toward the basketball court. Farther along the riverbank, past where my father was working, voices rose in a chorus of shouts. I did not know it then, but a frothy wave had just swamped over the highest part of the earthen dam, and the water churned and foamed, and men suddenly found themselves up to their elbows in trouble as the river burst through. In the next second, the men were bowled over by the twisting currents, and Mr. Stelko, the lyrics manager, aged by ten years when he put his hand out to seize a grip and felt a log-sized, scaly shape moving past him in the turbulence. Mr. Stelko was struck dumb and peed in his pants at the same time, and when he found his voice to scream, the monstrous reptile was gone, following the flood into the streets of Bruton. Help me! Somebody help me! We heard the voice of a woman from nearby. She was a young black woman with a panic-stricken face. I didn't know her, but Mom said, What is it? Nyla Castile? Is that you? Yes, ma'am, it's Nyla. Who's that? Rebecca Mackinson. I used to read books to your mother. It's my daddy. Miss Rebecca, I think his hearts give out. Well, where is he? At the house over there. He can't stand up. You lead the way, Mom said. Water was rushing into the houses of Bruton. Nyla Castile's house, like so many others, was a narrow gray shotgun shack. She led us in, the river surging around us, and she shouted in the first room, Gavin, I'm back! It was dark in the room. 
but we saw an old black man sitting in a chair, the water up around his knees, and newspapers and magazines swirling in the current. He was clutching his hand to his wet shirt over his heart. His ebony face seamed with pain, and his eyes squeezed shut. Standing next to him, holding his other hand, was a little boy, maybe seven or eight years old. Grandpap's crying, Mama, the little boy said. I know he is, Gavin. Daddy, I've brought some help. Can you hear me, Daddy? The old man groaned. Oh, hurting mighty bad this time. We're going to help you stand up, going to get you out of here. He shook his head. Oh, honey, old legs gone. What are we going to do? Nyla looked at my mother, and I saw the bright tears in her eyes. My mother looked around. Wheelbarrow, have you got one? Nyla said that they'd borrowed a neighbor's wheelbarrow before, and she thought it might be up on their back porch. I waited with Gavin and his grandfather while Mom and Nyla wrestled the wheelbarrow in through the rising water. Then Nyla got on one side of the old man, and Mom got on the other. Gonna put you in this, Daddy. We can push you down to where Miss Rebecca says they're picking up people in trucks. They got him into the wheelbarrow, but real soon Mom and Nyla realized that they were both going to have a struggle pushing him and keeping his head above water. I saw the predicament. Out beyond the house, on the underwater street, Gavin's head would be submerged. A current might whisk him away like a corn husk. Who was going to hold him up? Mom made a decision. We'll have to come back for the boys. Corey, you and Gavin stand up on that table. The tabletop was awash, but it would keep us above the flood. I did as Mom told me, and Gavin pulled himself up too. We stood together, a small pine wood island beneath our feet. Mom said, All right, Corey, don't move from there. If you move, I'll give you a whipping you'll remember for the rest of your life, you understand? Yes, ma'am. Mom and Nyla Castile began the labor of pushing Nyla's father in the wheelbarrow against the brown water, each supporting one handle. They pushed it through the open doorway and across the flooded porch. I had never thought of my mother as being physically strong before. I guess you never know what a person can do until that person has to do it. We waited. Gavin pressed up against my side. He was starting to shiver now that he didn't have to be so brave for his grandpap. The water was lapping up over our soggy shoes. I asked Gavin if he knew any songs, and he said he knew On Top of Old Smokey, which he began to sing in a high, quavering, yet not unpleasant voice. His singing, more of a yodel, actually, attracted something that suddenly came paddling through the doorway. It was a brown dog, matted with mud. Its eyes gleamed wildly. Its breathing was harsh as it swam across the room toward us, through the flotsam of papers and other trash. Come on, boy, I called. The dog whimpered and yelped as a slow wave slipped through the door and lifted the animal up and down again. Water smacked the walls. I leaned down to get the struggling dog. I grasped its front paws. It looked up into my face, its pink tongue hanging out in the dank yellow light, as a born-again Christian might appeal to the Savior. I was lifting the dog out by its paw, and I felt a shudder. Something went crunch as fast as that, and then its head and shoulders were coming out of the murky water, and suddenly there was no more of the dog beyond the middle of its back. No hindquarters, no tail, no hind legs, Nothing but a gaping hole that started spilling a torrent of black blood and steaming guts. The dog made a whining sound. That's all. But its paws twitched, and its eyes were on me, and the agony I saw in them will last in my mind forever. I cried out, and what I said I will never know, and dropped the mess that had once been a dog. It splashed in, went under, came back up, and the paws were still trying to paddle. I heard Gavin shout something. Wanna want a moss? It sounded like. And then the water thrashed around the half of a carcass, the entrails streaming behind it like a hideous tail. And I saw the skin of something break the surface. It was covered with diamond-shaped scales the color of autumn leaves, pale brown, shimmering purple, deep gold and tawny russet. All the shades of the river were there, too from swirls of muddy ochre to moonlight pink. 
I saw a forest of muscles leached to its flesh, gray canyons of scars and fishhooks scarlet with rust. I saw a body as thick as an ancient oak twist slowly around in the water, taking its own sweet time. I was transfixed by the spectacle, even as Gavin wailed with terror. I knew what I was looking at, and though my heart pounded, and I could hardly draw a breath, I thought it was as beautiful as anything in God's creation. But beautiful or not, old Moses had just torn a dog in half. He was still hungry. This happened so fast, my mind hardly had time to see it. A pair of jaws opened, fangs glistened, and an old boot was in there, impaled on one of them, along with a flopping silver fish. The jaws sucked the remaining half of the dog's carcass in with a snarling rush of water, and then closed delicately, as one might savor a lemonhead candy at the Lyric Theater. I caught a quick glimpse of a narrow, pale green cat's eye the size of a baseball, shielded with a gelatinous film. Then Gavin fell back off the table into the water. I jumped off the table to where Gavin had gone in. The water was heavy with mud up to my shoulders, which meant Gavin was nostrils deep. He was flailing and kicking, and when I grabbed him around the waist, he must have thought it was old Moses, because he almost jerked my arms off. I shouted, Gavin, stop kicking! And I got his face up out of the water. Oh, oh, oh. He was babbling like a rain-soaked engine trying to fire its plugs. I heard a noise behind me in that dark and soggy room. The noise of something rising from the water. I turned around. Gavin yelped and grabbed hold with both arms around my neck, all but throttling me. I saw the shape of old Moses, huge, horrible, breathtaking, coming up from the water like a living swamp log. Its head was flat and triangular like a snake's. But I think it was not just a snake because it seemed to have two small arms with spindly claws just below what would have been the neck. I heard what must have been its tail thwacking against a wall so hard the house shook. Its head bumped the ceiling. Gavin's grip was making my face balloon with blood. Old Moses' snaky head began to descend toward us like the front end of a steam shovel, and I heard the hiss of its jaws opening. I backed up, hollering at Gavin to let go, but he would not. If I'd been him, I wouldn't have let go either. The head came at us, but just then I backed out of the front room into a narrow corridor, and old Moses' jaws slammed against the door frame on either side of us. This seemed to make him mad. He drew back and drove forward again with the same result, except this time the door frame splintered. Gavin was crying, making a hoo, 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 sound, and a frothy wave from old Moses' agitation splashed into my face over my head. Something jabbed my right shoulder, scaring a ripple up my spine. I reached for it and found a broom floating in the debris. Old Moses made a noise like a locomotive about to blow its gaskets. I saw the awful shape of its head coming at the corridor's entrance, and I thought of Gordon Scott's Tarzan, spear in hand, fighting against a giant python. I picked up the broomstick, and when old Moses hit the doorway again, I jammed that broom right down its gaping dog-swallowing throat. You know what happens when you touch your fingers to the back of your throat, don't you? Well, the same thing happens evidently to monsters. Old Moses made a gagging noise as loud as thunder in a barrel. The head drew back, and the broom went with it, corn straw bristles jammed in the gullet. Then, and this is the only way I can describe it, Old Moses puked. I mean it. I heard the rush of liquid and gruesome things flooding from its mouth. Fish. Some still flopping and some long dead went flying all around us along with stinking crayfish, turtle shells, mussels, slimy stones, mud and bones. The smell was, well, you can imagine it. It was a hundred times worse than when the kid in school throws up his morning oatmeal on the desk in front of you. Gavin took a gasping breath and yelled his head off. At that point I started yelling too. Help! Somebody help us! Then, 
I heard the voice of judgment. Corey, I told you not to move, didn't I? Gavin? Gavin? Lord God, what's that smell? My mother said. The water was settling down. I realized that old Moses was no longer between the two mothers and their sons. Dead fish floated in a slimy brown sludge on the surface. But Mom's attention was on me. I'm going to tan your hide, Corey Mackinson, she shouted as she waded in with Nyla Castile behind her. Then they walked right into the floating monster's disgorgement. And from the sound she made, I don't believe my mother was thinking about whipping me anymore. Lucky me. Two weeks passed. We left April and moved through the sunny days of May. The Tecumseh River, having reminded us who was boss, returned to its banks. A quarter of the houses in Bruton weren't worth living in anymore, including Nyla Castile's, so the sound of sawing and hammering in Bruton was almost around the clock. There was one benefit of the rain and the flood, though. Under the sunshine, the earth exploded in flowers, and zephyr blazed with color. Lawns were deep emerald, honeysuckle grew like mad passion, and kudzu blanketed the hills. Summer was almost upon us. I had a dream about the man in the long coat and the green feathered hat. I dreamed I was wading toward him, and when I grasped his arm, he turned his face toward me, and it was a man with not human skin, but diamond-shaped scales, the color of autumn leaves. He had fangs like daggers and blood dripping down his chin, and I realized I had interrupted him in the process of eating a small brown dog, the upper half of which he held struggling in his left hand. It was not a pleasant dream, but maybe there was some truth in it. Somewhere. Then one afternoon, we received a summons from the lady. It came in the form of a letter, hand-delivered by Mr. Lightfoot in his old clankety pickup truck. I'd be honored, the letter said, if you would come to my house at seven o'clock this Friday evening. Please bring your son. But Dad wouldn't go. He and Mom had a very intense discussion about it, but Dad said the lady did things with bones and black cats, and he didn't want to mess with her. He decided he'd better stay home and listen to the ball game. Mom took me to see the lady. We dressed in Sunday clothes and drove through Bruton in the pickup truck to where the lady lived. The small frame house, as I've already mentioned, was painted in a blaze of orange, purple, red, and yellow. A garage was set off to the side, where I figured the rhinestone-covered Pontiac was stored. The yard was neatly trimmed, and a sidewalk led from the curb to the porch steps. The house appeared neither scary nor the residence of royalty. It was just a house, and except for its coat of many colors, very much like every other house on the street. Still, I balked when Mom came around and opened my door. Come on, she said. Her voice had tightened, though her nervousness didn't show in her face. Somehow I got up the porch steps to the door. The porch light was painted yellow to keep bugs away. I'd imagined the door's knocker might be a skull and crossbones. It was instead a small silver hand. Mom said, Here goes, and she rapped on the door. We heard footsteps. It occurred to me that our time to flee was running out. Mom put her arm around me, and I thought I could feel her pulse beating. Then the door's knob turned. The door opened, and the moon man stood in the doorway. Come right in, Miss Mackinson. He smiled. Seeing him so close caused a start for my mother and me. The moon man wore a light blue shirt with the sleeves rolled up, a pair of black trousers, and suspenders. Tonight, he had only one wristwatch on, and the white rim of a T-shirt showed instead of his chain at huge gilded crucifix. He wasn't wearing his top hat. The splotchy division of pale yellow and ebony flesh continued up his high forehead and ended in a cap of white wool. The white beard on his chin was pointed and curled slightly upward. His dark, wrinkle-edged eyes rested on first my mother and then me. He lifted a thin finger and motioned us into the hallway. 
it was time to meet the lady. She's not been feeling well, the moon man told us. Dr. Paris been loading her up with vitamins. It's not anything serious, is it? Mom asked. The rain got in her lungs. She doesn't get along so good in damp weather, but she's doing better now that the sun's been out. We came to a door. The moon man opened it, his shoulders frail and stooped. I smelled musty violets. He spoke softly. Your callers are here. Sheets rustled within the room. Please, send them in, said the shaky voice of an old woman. My mother took a breath and walked into the room. I had to follow, because she gripped my hand. The moon man stayed outside. After we walked past him, he gently closed the door, and there she was. She lay in a bed with a white metal frame, her back supported by a brocaded pillow and the top sheet pulled over her chest. The walls of her bedroom were painted with green fronds and foliage, and but for the polite drone of a box fan, we might have been standing in an equatorial jungle. An electric lamp burned on the bedside table, where magazines and books were stacked, and within her reach was a pair of wire-rimmed glasses. The lady just stared at us for a moment, and we at her. She was almost bluish-black against the white bed, and not an inch of her face looked unwrinkled. She reminded me of one of those apple dolls whose faces shrivel up in the hard noonday sun. I had seen handfuls of fresh snow scraped off the ice house's pipes. The lady's soft cloud of hair was whiter. She was wearing a blue gown, the straps up around her bony shoulders, and her collarbone jutted in such clear relief against her skin that it appeared painful. So too did her cheekbones. They seemed sharp enough to slice a peach. To tell the truth, though, except for one feature, the lady wouldn't have looked like much but an ancient, reed-thin black woman whose head trembled with a little palsy. But her eyes were green. I don't mean any old green. I mean the color of pale emeralds, the kind of jewels Tarzan might have been searching for in one of the lost cities of Africa. They were luminous, full of trapped and burning light, and looking into them, you felt as if your secret self might be jimmied open like a sardine can and something stolen from you. And you might not even mind it, either. You might want it to be so. I had never seen eyes like that before, and I never have since. They scared me, but I could not turn away because their beauty was like that of a fierce, wild animal who must be carefully watched at all times. The lady blinked, and a smile winnowed up over her wrinkled mouth. If she didn't have her own teeth, they were good fakes. Don't you both look nice, she said in her palsied voice. Thank you, ma'am, Mom managed to answer. Your husband didn't want to come. Uh, no, he's uh, listening to the baseball game on the radio. Was that his excuse, Miss Mackinson? She lifted her white eyebrows. I, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> Some people are scared of me. Can you beat that? Scared of an old woman in her one hundred and sixth year. And me laying here can't even keep no supper down. You love your husband, Miss Mackinson? Yes, I do. Very much. That's good. Love strong and true can get you through a lot of dookie. And I'm here to tell you, honey, you got to walk through many fields of dookie to get to be my age. Those green, wonderful, and frightening eyes in that wrinkled ebony face turned full blaze on me. Hello, young man. You help your mama do chores? Yes, am It was a dry whisper. My throat felt parched. You dry the dishes? Keep your room neat? 
You sweep the front porch. Yes, sir. That's fine. But I bet you never had called to use a broom like you used one at Nyla Castile's house. Did you? I swallowed hard. Now I and my mother knew what this was about. The lady grinned. I wish I'd been there. I swore I do. Did Nyla Castile tell you? Mom asked. She did. I had a long talk with little Gavin, too. You saved Gavin's life, young man. Do you know what that means to me? I shook my head. Nyla's mother, God keep her, was a good friend of mine. I kind of adopted Nyla. I always thought of Gavin as a great-grandchild. Gavin has a good life ahead of him. You made sure he'd get there. I was just keeping from getting eaten up myself, I said. She chuckled. It was a gaspy sound. <laughs> Run him off with a broomstick. <laughs> Lord, Lord. He thought he was such a mean old thing. Thought he could swim right up out of that river and snatch him a feast. But you gave him a mouthful, didn't you? He ate a dog, I told her. Yeah, he would, the lady said. And her chuckling died down. Her thin fingers intertwined over her stomach. Step closer. Come around here, real close. I walked to the side of the bed, and those green eyes were right there in front of me like spirit lamps. What do you like to do? I like to play baseball. Uh, I like to read. I like to write stories. Her eyebrows went up again. Write stories? Lord, Lord, we got us a writer here. Corey's always liked books, Mom offered. He writes little stories about cowboys and detectives and monsters, sometimes, I said. Monsters, the lady repeated. You gonna write about old Moses? I might. Look at me, she said. I did. Deep, she said. I did. And then something strange happened. She began to speak, and as she spoke, the air seemed to shimmer between us with a pearly iridescence. Her eyes had captured mine. I could not look away. I heard her speak. I've been called a monster. Been called worse than a monster. I've been to Leopardsville, and I've rowed a boat through the flooded mansions. Her face through that shimmering haze had begun to shed its wrinkles. She was getting younger as I stared at her. I've seen the dead walking, and my best friend had scales and crawled on her belly. Her face was younger still. Its beauty began to scorch my face. I've seen the mask maker. I've spat in Satan's eye, and I've danced in the halls of the dark society. She was a girl with long black hair, her cheekbones high and proud, her chin sharp, her eyes fearsome with memories. Her voice was clear and strong. I have lived a hundred lifetimes, and I'm not dead yet. Can you see me, young man? Yes, I can, I answered and I heard myself as if from a vast distance. The spell broke, quick as a heartbeat. One second, I was looking at a beautiful young woman, and the next, there was the lady as she really was, one hundred and six years old. Her eyes had cooled some, but I felt feverish. Maybe someday you write my life story, the lady told me. It sounded more like a command than a comment. Now, why don't you go out and visit with my husband while I talk to your mama? I said I would. My legs were rubbery as I walked past Mom to the door. 
sweat had crept around my collar. The lady turned to my mother and assured her I'd be all right outside. Then she said, Been dreaming, been dreaming asleep and awake. Things ain't right here no more. Things are tore up on the other side, too. The other side? Where the dead go? Across the river. Not the Tecumseh. The broad, dark river where I'm going to be going before too much longer. Then I look back and laugh. And I say, so that's what it's all about. Mom shook her head uncomprehending. The lady went on. Things are tore up in the land of the living and the world of the dead. I knew something was wrong when Dambala denied his food. Somebody's in terrible pain on the other side. Mom shook her head again. I don't understand, the lady finished for her. I know you don't. Sometimes I don't either. But I know the language of pain, Miss Mackinson. I grew up speaking it. The lady reached over to her bedside table, opened a drawer, and took out a piece of lined notebook paper. She gave it to my mother. You recognize this? Mom stared at it. On the paper was the pencil sketch of a head, a skull it looked to be, with wings swept back from its temples. In my dream, I seen a man with that tattoo on his shoulder. I see a pair of hands, and in one hand there's a billy club wrapped up with black tape. We call it a cracker knocker. And in the other, there's a wire. I can hear voices, but I can't tell what's being said. Somebody's yelling, and there's music being played real loud. Music? Mom was cold inside. She had recognized the winged skull from what Dad had told her about the corpse in the car. The lady nodded. Either a record or somebody's beating hell out of a piano. Your husband was the one who saw the dead man go down in Saxon's Lake, ain't that right? Yes. Might this have anything to do with it? Mom took a deep breath and then let it out. Yes, I thought so. Your husband sleeping all right? No, he has bad dreams about the lake and the man in it. The lady nodded again. Trying to reach your husband. Trying to get his attention. I'm just picking up the message like a party line on a telephone. Message? What message? Mom asked. I don't know. But that kind of pain can sure enough drive a man out of his mind. Tears began to blur my mother's vision. The lady touched her arm. You show him that picture. Tell him to come see me if he wants to talk about it. Tell him he knows where I live. He won't come. He's afraid of you. You tell him this thing could tear him to pieces if he don't set it right. You tell him I could be the best friend he ever had. Mom nodded. She folded the notebook paper into a square and clenched it in her hand. The lady said, Wipe your eyes. You don't want the young man getting upset. My mother thanked the lady for her kindness. She said she'd talk to my father about coming to see her, but she couldn't promise anything. The lady nodded. I'll expect him when I see him. You take care of yourself and your family. We left Bruton. The river flowed gently between its banks. The night's breeze blew softly through the trees, and the lights glowed from windows as people finished their dinners. Mom told me what the lady had said to her. In my mind, 
I saw the hauntingly beautiful face of a young woman with green eyes. Summer was close upon us, its scent of honeysuckle and violets perfuming the land. Somewhere in Zephyr, a piano was being played. It was not an easy summer. There was a darkness to it that came from my dad's dreams. Sometimes at night, I awakened to hear him crying out in his sleep, and then I'd hear Mom trying to calm him down. I'd hear him say something like, In the lake, or down in the dark, and I knew what had gotten into his mind, like a black leech. He was losing weight. His face had begun changing, too. His cheekbones were getting sharper, his eyes sinking back in their sockets. And as the weeks went by and late spring simmered into summer, he still refused to go see the lady. I was getting scared for him. My birthday arrived. I had Davy Ray Callan, Ben Sears, and Johnny Wilson over for ice cream and cake. On that cake were twelve candles. And sometime during the cake eating, Dad put my birthday present on my desk in my room. Johnny had brought me two fine white arrowheads from his collection. Davy Ray had brought me an Aurora model of the mummy, and Ben's gift was a bag full of little plastic dinosaurs. But on my desk, with a clean sheet of white paper gripped in its roller, was a royal typewriter as gray as a battleship. It had some miles on it. The keys showed where, and ZPL was scratched on its side. The Zephyr Public Library, I later learned, had been selling some of their older equipment. The E key stuck, and the lowercase i was missing its dot. But I sat at my desk in the deepening twilight of my birthday, and I pushed aside my tin can full of Ticonderoga pencils, and heart-pounding, laboriously typed out my name on the paper. I had entered the technological age. I had a long way to go, but I sensed the excitement of the cowboy heroes, Indian braves, army troops, detective legions, and monster squads within me eager to be born. On the last day of school, my homeroom teacher, Mrs. Neville, had urged me to enter the Zephyr Arts Council writing contest. When I told her I wouldn't know what to write about, she said, You will. When you make yourself sit and look at a blank piece of paper long enough, you will. And don't think of it as writing. Just think of it as telling your friends a story. Will you at least try? I'll think about it, I said. The idea haunted me all through the height of summer especially after the gift of the typewriter. August came upon us, riding a wave of sultry heat, and one steamy evening I sat down at my typewriter to chop out a story for the Zephyr Arts Council writing contest. I started three different stories. None of them got beyond the first page. I sat there, staring at the fourth fresh sheet of paper. I thought about what Mrs. Neville had said. Don't think of it as writing. Think of it as telling your friends a story. What if, I asked myself, what if I was to write about something that really happened, like the dead man in the car at the bottom of Saxon's Lake? Now this I could get fired up about. I wrote the story and then rewrote it twice. It was two pages long, double-spaced. My masterpiece. When my dad first read it, he was angry. Angry that I hadn't told him about the figure I thought I'd seen in the woods. Angry that I wrote the story at all. He didn't want me to show it to anyone, much less enter it in the contest. But in the end, after he'd thought it over, he changed his mind. And so it was that in the dying days of summer, I received a phone call from Mrs. Evelyn Prathmore of the Zephyr Arts Council, informing me that I had won third place in the short story division of the writing contest. I was to be given a plaque with my name on it, she told me, would I be prepared to read my story during a program at the library the second Saturday of September? I was stunned. I stammered, uh, yes. Instantly, upon putting the telephone down, I was struck first with a surge of joy that almost lifted me out of my hush puppies, and then a crush of terror that about slammed me to the floor. Read my story? Aloud? To a room full of people I hardly knew? Mom calmed me down. That was part of her job, and she was good at it. She told me I had plenty of time to practice, and she said I had made her so proud she wanted to bust. She called Dad at the dairy, and he told me he'd bring me home two cold bottles of chocolate milk. 
Four days after school started, I came home to another phone call. This one was from Mayor Swope's office. The mayor wanted to see me. I couldn't imagine what for. A storm was blowing up, and Mom wanted me to wait an hour so Dad could drive me, but I couldn't wait. With Mom's reluctant permission, I rode my bike to the dark-stoned, gothic-styled courthouse at the end of Merchant Street. Thunder was rumbling, and it was starting to sprinkle by the time I got there. I chained my bike to a fire hydrant and went inside. The mayor's office was at the end of a long corridor on the second floor. The building was practically dark. Most of the people who worked there had gone home for the day. Mrs. Inez Axford, the mayor's secretary, ushered me into Mayor Swope's office. Everything was fashioned of dark, glistening wood. The air smelled of sweet pipe tobacco. Two burly black leather chairs faced the desk over an expanse of Persian carpet. Windows afforded a view of Merchant Street, but right now the rain was streaming down them. Mayor Swope told me to have a seat, and then he cleared his throat and smiled. <clears throat> Are your folks waiting for you? Uh, no, sir, I came on my bike. Oh, gosh, you're going to have a wet ride home. I don't mind. The mayor looked concerned. But then his smile crept back. I suppose you're wondering why I wanted to see you. I nodded. You know, I was on the panel to judge the riding contest. I enjoyed your story. Yes, sir, it deserved a prize. It surely did. He picked up a briar pipe and popped open a can of tobacco. I watched his fingers as he began to fill the pipe's bowl with bits of tobacco. You got a keen imagination, Corey. That part in your story about seeing somebody standing in the woods across the road, I like that part. How'd you happen to come up with that? It really happened, I was going to say. But before I could, somebody knocked on the door. Mrs. Axford looked in. May a swope? Lord, it's pouring cats and dogs. I couldn't even get to my car, and I just had my hair fixed yesterday. Do you have an umbrella I might borrow? I believe so, Inez. Look in that closet over there. She opened a closet and rummaged through it. She came out clutching an umbrella, but her nose was wrinkled, and in her other hand she was carrying two articles of clothing that were white with mildew. She held them out to the mayor. Look at these. I believe mushrooms are growing in here. My heart seized up. Mrs. Axford was holding a mildew-blotched overcoat and a hat that appeared to have been run through a washer and a ringer. And in the band of that battered hat was a silver disc and a crumpled green feather. Mrs. Axford made a face that might have stopped a clock. Who? what are you keeping this stuff for? That's my favorite hat. It was, at least. Got ruined the night of the flood, but I thought I could get it fixed. And I've had that raincoat for fifteen years. You want me to throw these in the garbage on my way out? The mayor shook his head. Oh, no, Lord, no, just put them back in there and close the door. With a great show of distaste, Mrs. Axford returned the items to the closet. The mayor told her to be careful going home. She said she would, gave me a quick glance, and walked out of the office with the umbrella. I don't think I drew a breath during that entire exchange. Now I pulled one in, and I shivered as the air burned my lungs. The mayor lit his pipe and turned back to me. Now, Corey, where were we? Oh, yes, the man across the road. How'd you come up with that? I, I... The green-feathered hat was in a closet ten feet from me. Mayor Swope was the man who'd worn it that night when the floodwaters had raged in the streets of Bruton. I never said it was a man, I answered. I just said it was somebody standing there. Well, that was a nice touch. I bet that was an exciting morning for you, wasn't it? He reached into his pocket. And when his hand came into view, there was a small silver blade in it. It was the knife I'd seen in his hand that night when I was afraid he was going to sneak up behind my dad and stab him in the back for what he'd seen at Saxon's Lake. Mayor Swope stood up, rain pelting the windows behind him. Lightning zigzagged over Zephyr, and the lights suddenly flickered. Thunder crashed. The mayor raised his eyebrows at me. Oh, my. <laughs> that was a little too close, wasn't it? Yes, sir. My hands were about to break the armrests of my chair. The mayor started out from behind his desk. I want you to wait right here for a minute. There's something I want to show you, and I think it'll explain things. 
He crossed the room, the pipe clenched between his teeth and a scrawl of smoke behind him, and he went out into the area where Mrs. Axford's desk was. He left the door ajar, and I could hear him opening the drawer of a filing cabinet. My gaze went to the closet. The green feather was in there, so close. What if I was to pluck it from its hat and compare it to the green feather I'd found on the sole of my shoe? If the feathers matched, what then? I had to move fast if I was going to move at all. I got up on rubbery legs and opened the closet. The reek of mildewed cloth hit me in the face like a damp slap. But the coat and the hat were there on the floor, nudged up into a corner. I heard the drawer slide shut. I grasped the feather and tugged at it. It tore loose from the hat band. Corey, what are you doing in... Lightning flared, so close you could hear the sizzle. The lights went out, and the next crack of thunder shook the windows. I stood in the dark, the green feather in my hand and Mayor Swope in the doorway. He called out to me. Don't move, Corey. Say something. I heard him shut the door. A floorboard creaked ever so quietly. He was moving. Corey. You know, don't you? Darn right I knew. Where are you, son? Talk to me. I didn't dare. How'd you find out? Just tell me that. I'm sorry you found out, Corey. I didn't want you to get hurt. My legs responded first. They propelled me across the Persian carpet toward the way out, and my lungs snagged a breath and my hand gripped the green feather. I don't know how near I passed to him, but I got to the door unhindered, opened it, and shot through as if from the barrel of a cannon. I collided with Mrs. Axford's desk. Corey! No! The mayor's voice was louder now. I caromed off the side of the desk, a human pinball in motion. A cold chill skittered up my spine as Mayor Swope's hand fell on my shoulder like a spider. No! He said. And his fingers started to close. I pulled loose. A chair was beside me, and I shoved it at Mayor Swope like a shield. He stumbled into it, and I heard him say, Ooh! as his legs got tangled up and he fell to the floor. Corey! Come back here, he hollered, as if he really thought I might. He was coming after me, and he was running, too. Corey, stop where you are, he shouted, fury in his voice. It was surely the voice of a crazed killer. And then I saw dank gray light streaming through the cupola over the staircase, and I started running down the stairs without even holding on to the railing, which was enough right there to cause my mother to go white-haired. Mayor Swope was puffing behind me, and his voice was losing its steam. No, Corey, no. I reached the bottom of the staircase, and I ran across the entrance lobby and out the front door into the chilly rain. The worst of the storm had already swept over Zephyr, and now squatted above the hills like a massive grayish-blue toad frog. I got my bike unlocked, but I left the chain hanging. I pedaled away from the courthouse, just as Mayor Swope came through the door, hollering for me to stop. The last thing he hollered, and I thought this was strange, coming from a crazed killer was, for God's sake, be careful. At home, I skidded to a stop at the front porch steps, and I ran inside, my hair plastered down with rain and my hand gripping the soggy green feather. As the screen door slammed, my mom called. Corey, Corey Mackinson, come here. Just a minute. I ran into my room, and I searched through the drawers until I found the White Owl cigar box. I opened it. And there was the green feather I'd found on the bottom of my shoe. Come here this instant, Mom shouted. Wait! I placed the first green feather down on my desk, and the green feather I'd plucked from the mayor's hat band beside it. Corey, come in here. I'm on the phone with Mayor Swope. Uh-oh. My feeling of triumph cracked, collapsed, cascaded around my wet sneakers. The first feather... The one that had come from the woods was a deep emerald green. The one from the mayor's hat band was about three shades lighter. Not only that, but the hat band feather was at least twice as large as the Saxon's lake feather. They didn't match one iota. The mayor, it turned out, had wanted to show me my plaque for winning third place in the short story contest. He'd asked me to come and see him because they'd spelled my name wrong. He'd wanted me to see it before the ceremony, so my feelings wouldn't be hurt. 
The plaque was going to be redone, but not in time for the awards. My sudden and unconventional exit had him plenty worried. He was afraid I was having some kind of fit. He asked if I was on medication. His tone indicated that if I wasn't, he thought I ought to be. I was mortified. In a choking voice, I apologized to the mayor, and then to my mom, and then again to Dad when he came home. By all rights, I should have been punished for my foolishness. But my folks simply sent me to my room for an hour, which was where I was going to go anyhow. The Saturday night of the Zephyr Arts Council Awards Ceremony arrived. The library was packed. Besides Mom and Dad, Ben and Davy Ray and Johnny were all there with their parents, and I saw Mayor Swope and Dr. Parrish. The lady was there, too. When I took the stage to read and my hands shook and something that felt like spiny eggs seemed to be lodged in my throat, I saw the lady rise to her feet at the back of the room. She lifted her chin, and that movement spoke a single word. Courage. As the words began to tumble out of my mouth, the words I'd conceived and given birth to, everyone became quiet and still. My voice seemed to get stronger as I read. It seemed to speak with expression and clarity, rather than being a mumbled drone, which is how it had begun. I was amazed and elated. I actually, wonder of wonders, was enjoying reading aloud. I reached the final sentence and ran out of story. As the applause rolled over me, led by my mom and dad, I knew that I wanted to be a writer more than anything on earth. After the award ceremony, as we were on our way out the door, the lady approached us, offered her congratulations, and spoke to my dad. She told him that the two of them had a matter of life and death to discuss. She reminded him that even Jesus Christ needed help sometimes, and he wasn't too proud to ask for it. On the way home, Mom said softly, I'll go with you if you want to go see her. I'll stay right by your side the whole time. She wants to help you. I wish you'd let her. Dad was silent. We were nearing the house. I'll think about it, he said. October came, and the hillsides lit up with gold and orange. Posters began appearing around town, as they did every year. Brandywine Carnival is on its way. And as we did every year, Johnny, Ben, Davy Ray, and I made plans for opening night. We always met at 6.30, when all the rides were going. But this year, a wrench was thrown into our plans. Miss Blue Glass was giving piano lessons again after a long hiatus, and Ben's mother had signed him up. His first lesson was scheduled for 6.30 on opening night of the Brandywine Carnival. At first, we despaired. But then Johnny came up with a plan. Why don't we just meet Ben at the Glasses' house? We can ride on to the carnival at 7 instead of 6.30. A stroke of genius. The Glass sisters lived about a half mile away, on Shantuck Street. By the time I got there, Davy Ray's bike was parked next to Johnny's and Ben's in front of the house, which looked like a gingerbread cottage Hansel and Gretel might have envied. From the porch, I could hear piano notes being banged behind the door. Then the high, fluty voice of Miss Blue Glass. Softly, Ben, softly. I pressed the doorbell. Chimes rang, and Miss Blue Glass said, Will you please answer that, Davy Ray? He opened the door as the banging continued. I could tell by his sick expression that listening to Ben trying to hammer out the same five notes over and over again wasn't good for your health. Is that Winifred Osborne? Miss Blue Glass called over the racket. No, ma'am. It's Corey Mackinson. He's waiting for Ben, too. Davy Ray told her. Bring him in, then. Too cold to wait outside. Ben was trapped at the keys of a gleaming brown upright piano, and Miss Blue Glass was standing beside the bench holding a conductor's baton. I eased down onto a sofa next to Davy Ray and Johnny. Now, thinking cap on, fingers flow like the waves. One, two, three, one, two, three. Three, Miss Blue Glass started motioning up and down with her baton as the pudgy fingers of Ben's right hand tried to play the same five notes with some resemblance to rhythm. Soon enough, though, he was pounding those notes as if trying to crush fire ants. Sonia, give that boy a rest. You're going to wear his fingers to the bone. Miss Greenglass walked out of a hallway into the living room. 
Not everybody's a musical genius like you, you know. Swirls of red had crept into Miss Blueglass's ivory cheeks. Yes, I do know. Thank you very much. I'll thank you not to interrupt Ben's lesson. His time's about over anyway. Who's your next victim? Winifred Osborne is my next student, Miss Blueglass said pointedly. I feared the Glass sisters were going to come to blows. Caught between them, Ben appeared about to leap from his skin. Then something went, Rawr! from the rear of the house. Miss Blueglass jabbed the baton at her sister and snapped, See there, you've upset him. Are you satisfied now? The door chimes rang. Miss Greenglass went to answer it, mumbling to herself. Miss Blueglass turned to her unwilling pupil. Ben, get up and I'll show you what you can be playing if you do your exercises like I've told you. Yes, ma'am. He jumped up. Miss Blueglass settled herself on the piano bench, her hands with their long, elegant fingers poised over the keyboard. She closed her eyes, getting in the mood, I guess. She told Ben, I used to teach this song to all my students when I was teaching piano full-time. Ever heard of Beautiful Dreamer? No, ma'am, Ben said. Davy Ray elbowed me in the ribs and rolled his eyes. Miss Blueglass began to play. Then a terrible screech intruded. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and strained at their roots. The noise felt like jagged glass hammered into your ear hole. Skulls and bones, Hannaford, skulls and bones, quicken and rinsing. Miss Blueglass stopped playing. Katharina, feed him a cracker. Miss Greenglass hollered back from the hall. It's that song. He goes insane every time you play it. Quack, dragging me packing, Hannaford, Hannaford. At that moment, a middle-aged man and a little girl, eight or nine years old, walked into the living room. I recognized the man. Mr. Eugene Osborne was the cook at the Bright Star Cafe. We're here for Winifred's piano lesson, he began, before the caterwauling started up again. Skulls and bones! Quack! Cricket and rinsing! What in the world is that racket? Mr. Osborne asked, his hand on the little girl's shoulder. Her blue eyes were wide and puzzled. Miss Blue Glass stood up from the piano. That's my parrot, Mr. Osborne. He's having a little trouble lately. The parrot was a bright turquoise blue, not a speck of any other color on him except for the yellow of his beak. He attacked the bars, blue feathers flying. Skulls and bones! Dragon me packing! You give him a cracker! I'm not getting my fingers snapped off, said Miss Greenglass. She put the birdcage down on the piano bench, none too gently. Miss Blueglass flushed red again. I fed yours all the time, and I sure risked my fingers. I'm not feeding that thing. Miss Blueglass threw up her hands. Well then, get him into the bedroom, put the nightcloth over him, and settle him down. I'm a slave. I'm just a slave in my own home, Miss Greenglass wailed. But she picked up the birdcage by his handle again and left the living room. The parrot shrieked in parting. Skulls and bones, quicken and rinsing. Mr. Osborne watched the departing parrot, then turned to Miss Blueglass. First time I ever heard a parrot curse in German. I'm sorry, Mr. Osborne. Miss Blueglass lifted her penciled-on eyebrows. I had started for the door with Ben, Johnny, and Davy Ray, but now I stopped and turned to listen. Mr. Osborne repeated what he'd said. Curse in German. I was a cook for the big red one in Europe. Got the chance to talk to a lot of prisoners, believe me. I know some foul words in German when I hear them. I just heard an earful. It wasn't just cursing, either. There were other German words in there, but they were all garbled up. My parrot is American, Miss Blueglass informed him with an upward tilt of her chin. I have no earthly idea what you're talking about. Mr. Osborne shrugged. Well, okay then, don't matter none to me. Davy Ray, Ben, and Johnny were out the door. Davy Ray called to me. Come on, Corey, we're late enough as it is. Ben shook his head as he got on his bike. Those two are loony. Man, that was even worse than school. I lagged behind the others, though they kept yelling at me to catch up. German curse words, I was thinking. How come Miss Sonia Glass's parrot knew German curse words? As far as I knew, neither of the sisters spoke anything but Southern English. And why did the parrot go crazy when Miss Blue Glass played Beautiful Dreamer? 
Then the happy sounds of the carnival drifted to me along with the aromas of buttered popcorn and caramel apples. I left the German cursing parrot behind and sped up to catch my buddies. Toward the end of the month, Dad bought a wire basket for me to put on my bike. At first, I thought it was pretty cool until I realized that now I would be expected to run all sorts of errands for Mom. It was about this time that she put up a hand-lettered sign on the bulletin board at church, announcing that she was selling pies and other baked goods. The reason for this, I learned later, was that Dad's hours had been cut back at the dairy. We were hurting for money, though I never would have known it. So I did my duty. Carrying pies and cakes around to people in the afternoons, one day, Lana Jean Swope, the mayor's wife, had Mom bake a pumpkin pie, her best seller, for Doctor Lazander. Mom said Mrs. Swope wanted to thank him for treating her dog. Mom put the pie in a box, and I peddled it over to the Lazander's house, which stood on three acres of cleared land between Merchants and Shantuck Streets. The two-storied house was white and square, precise and clean as arithmetic. I knocked on the back door. And in a minute, Mrs. Lazander answered. I offered her the box. Mom baked you and the doctor a pie. It's for Mrs. Swope. It's pumpkin. Oh, how very nice! She took it and sniffed around the lid. She frowned. Oh dear, does this have cream in it? Evaporated milk, I think. My mom made it this morning. It's very thoughtful of Mrs. Schwab and your mother, Corey, but I'm afraid neither of us can eat cream. We're both allergic to anything from a cow. She smiled. That's how we met, all red and blotched at a clinic in Rotterdam. Oh, gosh. Well, maybe you can give it to somebody else then. It's a real good pie. Mrs. Lazander thought for a moment. Yes, Corey. Maybe I could do that. Why don't you come in, and I'll make a phone call, and then perhaps you can take it for me. Mrs. Lazander ushered me into the den, then went back to the kitchen to use the phone. In the den, four bird cages hung from ceiling hooks. Two of them were empty, but the other two held a canary and a parakeet. A set of twelve ceramic birds rested atop a piano. Suddenly, I heard a dog barking. The sound was coming up from the basement through an air vent. I heard Doctor Lazander's voice too, saying soothing things to the dog. I could hear him as clearly as if he'd been on the telephone. I was engrossed in his words when Mrs. Lazander came into the room. Corey, you have given me a wonderful idea. I called Mrs. Schwab, and we have decided to give the pie to Miss Sonia Glass. You see, her poor parrot passed away just a few days ago, and perhaps this would cheer her up a little. I was shocked. That shrieking, cursing creature seemed a long way from death at Ben's piano lesson two weeks ago. It occurred to me that maybe Miss Greenglass had done it in. How, how did it die, Mrs. Lazander? She shook her head. A brain fever. It takes them so quickly. Sonia was quite heartbroken. I just hated to see her that way. Can you take the pie to her, Corey? She led me back into the kitchen and handed me the box. Outside, I returned the pumpkin pie to my bicycle basket and headed for the glasses house. I pedaled leisurely. The sun was warm and the hills were blazing yellow. I felt a little sorry for the Lazanders not being able to eat anything with cream in it. They couldn't eat ice cream or banana pudding or drink a glass of milk. Or... Suddenly, I stopped. I remembered something Sheriff Amory had said a long time ago. It seemed, whoever killed that guy. Knew how deep Saxon's Lake is, and they didn't know Dad was going to be there in his milk truck. They weren't expecting the milkman. Who wouldn't expect a milkman? Who wouldn't know that every morning, just before dawn, the milk trucks are making their rounds? Somebody who didn't drink milk. That's who. And the parrot. The parrot that cursed in German and shrieked when Miss Blue Glass played "Beautiful Dreamer." The parrot that died at Doctor Lazander's house, where the empty cages, two of them, hung by the piano. No, I whispered. No, it can't be. It made no sense, and I couldn't connect it at all. But I had to find out more. I took a detour on my way to the Glasses house. I stopped in front of the Bright Star Cafe. Mister Eugene Osborne worked in there. Mr. Eugene Osborne had heard the parrot curse in German, and he knew what it had said. I left my bike outside and walked into the Bright Star. It wasn't much of a place. 
just a few tables and booths and a counter. I asked old Mrs. Huckabee, who'd been a waitress there since long before I was born, if I could see Mr. Osborne. She yelled into the back for him, and he came out, wearing an apron and a white cap, wiping his hands on a cloth. I asked him if we could sit down for a minute. We went to a booth in the back and got situated. Mr. Osborne looked at me quizzically. I was at Miss Glass's house when you brought Winifred in for a piano lesson. Mr. Osborne nodded. I remember that. You remember the parrot? You said it was cursing in German. He nodded again. If I know German, it was, and I do. Can you remember what else that parrot said, Mr. Osborne? He closed his eyes, bringing it back. It sounded like a name. A name? What was it? Mm, Hannaford, I think it was. At least it sounded like it was close to that. Hannaford, I thought. Then I thought of something else. Do you remember something Miss Green, uh, Miss Katharina Glass said about the parrot going crazy when that song was played? Oh, yeah, Beautiful Dreamer. That's the song Miss Blue Glass taught me. Taught you? That's right. I took lessons from Miss Blue Glass. Oh, I guess it was four years ago when she was teaching full-time. She had a lot of older students, and she taught us all that song. Now that you mention it, I don't recall that parrot screaming around back then like he did that night. It's funny, huh? I nodded in agreement. Well, Corey, I best get back to work. Does that help you any? I think so. I'm not sure yet. I ran out of the Bright Star and jumped on my bike, pedaling for home. My mind was on the green feather. It could be a parrot's feather, but it was emerald green. Miss Blue Glass's German cursing parrot had been turquoise, not a speck of any other color on it except for the yellow of its beak. But I had remembered something Miss Blue Glass had said when Miss Green Glass refused to feed the parrot a cracker for fear of losing her fingers. Three words. I fed yours. Your what? Parrot? Did both Glass sisters own a parrot? Was there a second parrot? This one, emerald green and missing a feather? Somewhere else in that house? As silent as the first was raucous? At home, I dashed for my room and got out the feather. Then I was out again, shouting to Mom that I'd be right back. I headed for the Glass's house to deliver the pie and ask some more questions. At the gingerbread house on Shantuck Street, I knocked on the door, the pie in my hands and the feather in my pocket. Miss Blue Glass answered it. Corey Mackinson, what can I do for you? I brought you a pie, Miss Glass. It's for Mrs. Lysander on account of your parrot being dead. My mom made it. It's pumpkin. Miss Blue Glass looked momentarily confused, then a little sad. Why, why, how sweet. How very sweet. She took the pie and thanked me. But when I didn't go away, she said, was there anything else, Corey? May I come in for a minute? She moved away from the door, leaving it open. I walked into the house, the same museum of chintz I remembered from the night of Ben's piano lesson. Where's Miss Green... The other, Miss Glass. Miss Blue Glass put the pie down on a hall table and motioned me into the living room. My sister is not at home. May I help you with something? I decided to get right to the point. Miss Glass... Does your sister have a parrot? I saw tears come to Miss Blue Glass's eyes. She blinked and sniffed them back, then looked somewhat forlornly around the room. Dr. Lysander loved my parrot. He said my parrot was the gentlest bird he'd ever seen. But he hated that green one of Katharina's. I think he would have killed it, same as me if I could have gotten away with it. When it died, the devil ate a drumstick. I brought my hand out of my pocket and opened the fingers. My heart was going ninety miles a minute. Was this the color of your sister's parrot, Miss Glass? She gave the feather a sniffy glance. That's it. Lord knows I'd recognize one of his feathers. He was always flying against his cage and flinging him out. He was about bald when he died. She caught herself. Just a minute. What are you doing with one of his feathers? I found it. Somewhere. That bird died back in... Oh, when was it? I knew. March. Yes, it was March. The buds were starting to show, 
and we were choosing our Easter music. But, she frowned. Before she could go on, I interrupted with another question. What did the parrot die of, Miss Glass? A brain fever, same as my parrot. Dr. Lysander says it's common among tropical birds, and when it happens, there's not much can be done. What happened to it after it died? Did Dr. Lysander come and get it? No. It was sick. Wouldn't touch a grain of seed. Mine was sick at the same time, in fact. Katharina took them both to Dr. Lysander's office, and hers died the next night. Why are you asking all these strange questions, Corey? And I still don't understand why you have that feather. I can't tell you yet. I wish I could, but I can't. She leaned forward, smelling a secret. What is it, Corey? I swear I won't breathe it to a soul. I can't say honest. I returned the feather to my pocket, and Miss Blue Glass's face slowly dropped. I'd better be going. I hated to bother you, but it was important. I glanced at the piano as I went to the door, and a thought struck me like an arrowhead lodging right between my eyes. I remembered the lady saying she'd dreamed of hearing piano music and seeing hands holding piano wire and a cracker knocker. I recalled the piano in the room where all the ceramic birds were at Dr. Lysander's house. I turned back to Miss Blueglass. Did you ever teach Dr. Lysander to play the piano? I asked. Dr. Lysander? No, but his wife took lessons. His wife? Big, horse-faced Veronica. Was it recently? No, it was four or five years ago, when I was teaching full-time. Mrs. Lysander won several gold stars, as I recall. Gold stars? I give gold stars for excellence. Mrs. Lysander could have been a professional pianist, in my opinion. She has the hands for it. And she loved my song. You mean Beautiful Dream? Beautiful Dreamer, she corrected me. Something was taking shape, but it was still a long way off. I excused myself again and headed for the door. As I pedaled home, I was trying to put everything together in my head. The pieces were there. But how did they fit? When I got home, I explained to my mom what had happened with the pie. Then I went to my room and put on my thinking cap. And I came to this conclusion. Both parrots had been at Dr. Lysander's the night in March the unknown man had been murdered. The green parrot had died that night and the blue one had come away cursing in German when Beautiful Dreamer was played on the piano. Mrs. Lysander played the piano. Mrs. Lysander knew Beautiful Dreamer. Was it possible, then, that when Miss Blueglass had played that song, her parrot remembered something that was said, or cursed and shouted in the German language, while Mrs. Lysander had been playing it? And why would Mrs. Lysander be playing a piano while somebody was shouting and cursing? Yes, I thought. Yes. Mrs. Lysander had been playing the piano to cover up the shouts and cursing. Only both parrots had been in that room, in the bird cages there. But it seemed unlikely that anybody would be hollering and cursing right over her shoulder, didn't it? I remembered Dr. Lysander's voice rising up through the air vent from his basement office. Had he feared, on that night in March, that the noise of shouting might be heard outside the house? And that was why Mrs. Lysander had been playing the first song that came to mind as the two parrots listened and remembered? Had Dr. Lysander beaten that unknown man with a cracker knocker in the basement and strangled him as the parrots listened? Maybe it had taken almost all night, the noises of violence making both parrots thrash against their cages. Then, when the deed was done, Dr. Lysander and his big horsey wife had carted the naked body out to that unknown man's car, and either one of them had driven to Saxon's Lake while the other followed in their own car. But they hadn't realized that a green feather had whirled out of a bird cage and wound up in the folds of a coat or the depths of a pocket. And since both the Lysanders were allergic to milk, they weren't on the dairy's delivery list, and they didn't know what time Dad would be on Route 10. Who knows? Hannaford? Maybe it had been like that. Maybe. Or maybe not.
After all, Dr. Lysander was Dutch, not German. And who was the unknown man? What possible link could a man with the tattoo of a winged skull on his shoulder have with Zephyr's veterinarian? I told my parents none of this. When I was ready, I would. I wasn't, so I didn't. But I was convinced, now more than ever, that a stranger lived among us. Four days after Thanksgiving, Dad lost his job. Not long after that, he finally went to see the lady. Mom and I went with him to the brightly colored house in Bruton. The moon man showed us into a small, mostly bare room across the hall from the lady's bedroom. Dad sat at a table, and Mom and I took chairs along the wall. The lady came in and sat at the table with Dad. She told Dad that she was picking up snippets of the same dreams he was having. She told him, You and me are plugged into the same socket, Tom, but you're getting more juice than I am. Dad told her about his dreams, about the flash of the car, the man's face, and the voice calling to him, Come with me, down in the dark. The lady asked him what he thought that meant. And Dad said, I think he wants me to come to that lake and drown myself in it. I think he wants me to come with him down in the dark. The lady watched him intently, her eyes gathering light. Why would he want you to do that, Tom? I don't know. Maybe he wants company. Does he call you by name? No. You know, that's funny, don't you think? If the dead man has a chance to speak to you, to give you a message, then why does he waste it on asking you to commit suicide? Why doesn't he tell you who killed him? Dad blinked. I never thought about that. Seems he would if he could. The lady nodded. He could. If he was speaking to you, that is. I'm not following you. The lady said, Maybe there are three plugs in that socket. Realization crawled over Dad's face, over mine and Mom's, too. The dead man isn't speaking to you, Tom. He's speaking to his killer. You mean I'm... The lady finished the sentence for him. Picking up the killer's dreams like I'm picking up yours. Oh, mercy, you got some strong dream eyes, Tom. He doesn't want me to kill myself because I couldn't get him out? The lady shook her head slowly. No. Of that? I'm sure. Dad pressed a hand to his mouth. His shoulders trembled. The burden was leaving him, ton by ton. He drew a deep, gasping breath, like the breath of someone whose head has just broken the surface of dark water. You interested in trying to find out who that killer might be? The lady asked. Dad nodded. The lady brought out a small bottle of clear liquid, a plastic bag full of cotton swabs, and something wrapped in a blue cloth. She said to Dad, Hold out your index finger. Why? Because I said so. The lady opened the bottle and upturned it over one of the cotton swabs. Then she dabbed the tip of Dad's index finger. Alcohol. Get it from Dr. Parrish, she explained. She put a piece of typing paper on the table. Then she unwrapped the object in the blue cloth. It was a stick, with two needles driven through one end. Dad looked concerned. What are you going to do? You're not going to jab me with those. I the needles came down fast, and rather roughly into the tip of Dad's finger. Ouch! Instantly, blood began to well up from the needle holes. Keep your blood off that paper, she told him. Working quickly, she dabbed alcohol on the index finger of her own right hand, and with her left, she whacked the needles down. 
Her blood was drawn, too. She looked up at Dad. Ask your question. Not aloud, but in your mind. Ask it clearly. Ask it like you expect an answer. Go ahead. After a few seconds, Dad said, All right. What now? What was the date that car went into Saxon's Lake? Uh, March 16th. Squeeze eight drops of blood on the center of the paper. Don't be stingy. Eight drops. Not one more and not one less. Dad squeezed his finger and the blood began dripping. The lady added eight drops of her own red blood to the white paper. Dad said, Good thing it didn't happen on the 31st. Take the paper in your left hand and crumple it up with the blood inside it. Dad did as she said. Then she told him, Hold it and repeat the question aloud. Who killed that man at the bottom of Saxon's Lake? The lady held out her left palm. Give it to me. She held the paper for about fifteen seconds more. Then she placed the crumpled paper in the middle of the table. Open it, she said. Dad took it. As he began to uncrumple it, my heart was slamming. If Dr. Lysander was scrawled there in blood, I was going to split my skin. When the paper was open, Mom and I peered over his shoulder. There was a great blotch of blood in the middle of the paper and other blotches all around it. Then the lady picked up a pencil and studied the paper for a moment, after which she began to play Connect the Blotches. I watched the pencil's tip at work. It drew a number three, and then another three, and then it ran out of blotches to connect. The lady frowned. That's it. Two threes. Dad sucked at his wounded finger. That's it? You sure you did this right? Words cannot describe the look she gave him. Two threes. That's the answer. Three, three. Maybe thirty-three. If we can figure out what that means, we'll have the killer's name. The lady removed her professional face after that and became sociable. We were served chocolate roulage made by Mrs. Pearl from the bake shop. Dad who had been eating like a bird before we came to the ladies, ate two whopping pieces of roulage and washed them down with two cups of hot black chicory coffee. My father was well and truly returned. Maybe even better than he was before. When we got home, Dad sat down with a telephone book and scanned the names and addresses. Philip Caldwell at 33 Ridgeton Street. J. E. Grayson at 33 Dearman Street, and the Crafts Barn at 33 Merchant Street. None of those got us anywhere. But while we were running around in the pickup truck, we stopped at the filling station for gas. Mr. Hiram White shambled out of his cathedral of engine belts and radiators and started pumping the gas in. He and Dad struck up a conversation. They talked about the weather for a minute. Then Mr. White said, New bus coming in tomorrow. The Trailways bus came through town at noon several days a week, and Mr. White's gas station also served as the Zephyr bus stop on those rare occasions when anyone was coming to or leaving Zephyr on the bus. Dad leaned on the truck. Is that right? Yep, new bus. You know Cornelius McGraw been driving old 33 for eight years? Dad shook his head. I don't know him personally. Mr. White finished the job and pulled the nozzle from the truck's gas port. He wiped the end with a cloth so no drop of gas would mar the pickup's paint. Well, he said they're finally retiring that old bus. He was old when he took it over. New bus has the route starting tomorrow, but Corny's still driving it. Still number 33, too, so things don't change that much, do they? I don't know about that, Dad said, and pulled out his money to pay him. When it was about halfway to Mr. White's hand, Dad froze. He looked at Mr. White. Did you say 33? Mr. White smiled, a little puzzled. 
Yeah, that's the number of the bus. Thirty-three. And when's number thirty-three due back again? Noon tomorrow, same as always. Dad said he'd be there. I was there with him as noon approached. Mr. White was driving us crazy, talking about how hard it was to find good gojo to clean the grease off your hands anymore. Then Dad said, "Here it comes, Corey." And he walked from cold shadow into crisp sunlight to meet it. The trailways bus. With number thirty-three on the plate above its windshield, swept on past without even slowing, though Mr. McGraw honked the horn and Mr. White waved. Dad watched it go, but he turned to Mr. White again, and I saw by the set of his jaw that now my father was a man with a mission. Bus come through day after tomorrow, Hiram. Sure does. Twelve noon, same as always. Dad said, "Hiram, you need any help around here?" Well, I don't know if I. I'll take a dollar an hour. I'll pump the gas. I'll clean the garage. I'll do whatever you ask me to do. You want me to work overtime? That's fine. A dollar an hour. How about it? Mr. White grunted and stared at the cluttered garage. Now I reckon I do need some stuff inventoried: brake shoes, gaskets, radiator hoses, and such. And I could use another strong back. This from the Quasimodo of the belts. He stuck out his hand. Got a job if you want it. Starting six in the morning, if that's all right. I'll be here, Dad said, grasping Mr. White's hand. My father was nothing if not resourceful. The bus passed through once more without even a hiss of brakes, but it was due again, twelve noon, same as always. And my dad would be there. December advanced, cold as the tomb. At eleven o'clock on the morning of Saturday the sixteenth. I said goodbye to Mom and left home on my bike to meet Ben and Johnny at the Lyric. The sky was plated with clouds, the threat of freezing rain in the air. I was bundled up like an Eskimo, but I'd soon be shedding my coat and gloves. The movie for today was called "Hell Is for Heroes," the poster of which showed the sweating faces of American soldiers crouched down behind machine gun and bazooka, awaiting the enemy attack. On my way to the theater. I took a fateful turn. I pedaled to Doctor Lazander's house. I hadn't seen him at church recently. I was beginning to wonder if he and Mrs. Lazander hadn't flown the coop. Several times I'd started to tell Dad my suspicions, but when it came right down to it, I had nothing but a green feather, and two dead parrots. I stopped at the bottom of the driveway and sat there watching the house. It was dark, empty. I wondered. I kept watch. There was no sign of light or life. The heroes and the fighting men could wait. I had to find out, and I began to pedal up the driveway to the house. I went around back. I eased my bike down on the kickstand, and peered into the nearest window. Dark upon dark. At first, I saw only shapes of furniture, but as my eyes grew used to the gloom, I was able to make out the twelve ceramic birds perched atop the piano. It was the den where the bird cages were. Doctor Lazander's office was below, closer to hell. Lights hit me. My heart hammered. I felt like a prisoner in a jailbreak movie, caught by the roaming circle. I twisted around, and a car pulled up to the back porch. It was a late model steel gray Buick with a chrome radiator that resembled a grinning mouthful of silver teeth. The doctor's work was well paid. I made a move toward my bike, but I heard a voice say, "Who is that?" Mrs. Lazander got out. Her bulk made bearish in a brown overcoat. She must have recognized my bike because my collar was turned up. Corey, I was caught. Easy, I thought. Just take it easy. Yes, ma'am, it's me. Mrs. Lazander turned back to the car as she spoke. So this is providential. Will you help me, please? I've got some groceries. She went around to the passenger side and opened the door. Then hefted the first of a half dozen burdened paper bags. "I'm going to the movies," I said. "Oh, it will just take a minute." What could be done to me in broad daylight? I took the bag. Mrs. Lazander, a second bag under one arm, slid her key into the back door's lock. A gust of wind blew around us, and I saw the folds of her overcoat move. And I knew she had been the figure I saw standing at the edge of the woods. Go on, the door's open. 
With Mrs. Lysander hulking at my back and a boulder of fear in my throat, I walked across the threshold as if into a mine shaft. Mr. White peered out the gas station window. The clouds had darkened. The gas station's light splashed across the concrete. Little flecks of sleet were striking the glass. Dad took the opportunity for a glance at the clock on the wall, which showed twelve minutes before noon. All right, where was I? Mr. White rubbed his chin and pondered his dominoes like a hunchbacked sphinx. He reached for one. Something hissed. Dad turned his head to the left. The trailway's bus was pulling in. Mr. White glanced up. How do, how do, look who's early this fine day. Dad was already on his feet. He walked past the cash register and the shelves of oil and gasoline additives and out into the cold. The bus pulled to a halt beneath the yellow trailway's bus sign. The doors folded outward with a breath of hydraulics. Two men were getting off. Sleet hit Dad in the face and the wind whirled around him, but he stood his ground. One of the men looked to be in his sixties, the other half those years. The older man, who wore a tweed overcoat and a brown hat, carried a suitcase. The younger, dressed in blue jeans and a beige jacket, carried a duffel bag. The older one had a wrinkled face, but a chin like a slab of granite. He was wearing glasses, flecks of sleet on the lenses. Sir, pardon me, is there a hotel? He had a foreign accent. Borden House will do, the younger one said. He had thinning blonde hair and a flat Midwestern brogue. Dad shook his head. No hotel in town, no boarding house either. We don't get a lot of visitors here. The older one frowned. Oh, my. Where's the nearest hotel, then? There's a motel in Uniontown, the Union Pines. You fellas need a ride? That would be very nice. Thank you, Mr. Tom Mackinson. He shook the gloved hand. The man's grip jammed his knuckles. Jacob Steiner. This is my friend, Lee Hannaford. Pleased to meet the both of you, Dad said. Mrs. Lysander had shed her overcoat, and beneath it she wore a somber gray dress. She took a jar of Folger's instant coffee out of a grocery sack and opened it with a slight wrist twist. With her broad back to me, she said, May I ask why you were looking in the window? I... Uh, think fast, I told myself. I uh, thought I'd drop by because, uh... Mrs. Lysander turned around and watched me, her eyes flat and impassive. Because I wanted to ask Dr. Lysander if he, uh, like, needed some help in the afternoon. I thought maybe I could uh, clean up downstairs or sweep or... I shrugged. Whatever. A hand grasped my shoulder from behind. I almost cried out. I came very close to it. As it was, I felt my face freeze as the blood left it. Dr. Lysander said, An ambitious young man. Isn't that right, Veronica? Yes, Franz. She turned away from me and continued putting the groceries up. He released me. I looked at him. He obviously had just awakened. His eyes were sleep-swollen. The hairs had come out in a grizzle around his neatly trimmed chin beard and he was wearing a red silk robe over pajamas. He yawned and stifled it with the same hand that had just been on my shoulder. Coffee, please, dearest. The blacker, the better. She began to spoon coffee into a cup that had the picture of a collie on it. Then, that task done, she turned on the hot water faucet. Dr. Lysander told his wife, I heard East Berlin this morning around four. A wonderful orchestra was playing Wagner. Mrs. Lysander filled the collie cup full of steaming water and stirred it. She handed the ebony coffee to her husband, who first inhaled its aroma. Ah, yes, this should do the trick. He took a little slurpy sip. Mm, good and strong, he said, satisfied. I edged toward the back door. I uh, better be going now. Ben Sears and Johnny Wilson are waiting for me at the Lyric. I thought you wanted to ask me about an afternoon job. Well, I better go. Oh, nonsense. He reached out again, and his hand found my shoulder. He had iron in his fingers. 
I'd be pleased and happy to have you come by and help in the afternoons, Corey. As a matter of truth, I've been looking for a young apprentice. Really? I didn't know what else to say. He smiled with his mouth. His eyes were careful. Really? You're a smart young man, aren't you? Sir? A smart young man. Oh, don't be so modest. You pursue things, don't you? You grip a fact and shake it like a terrier. His mouth smiled again, and the silver tooth sparkled. He took a longer sip of coffee. I don't know what you mean. I heard my voice tremble, the slightest bit. I admire that quality in you, Corey, that terrier determination to get to the root of things. That's a fine quality for a boy to have. His bicycle's outside, Franz, Mrs. Lysander said, as she put away packs of rice roni the San Francisco treat. Bring it in, will you? I've got to go, I said, and now the fear had started choking me. He smiled once again. Nonsense. If we have a freezing rain, and it certainly looks grim out there today, you don't want that bicycle of yours to be covered with ice, do you? I really have to... I'll bring it in, Mrs. Lysander said, and she went outside. I watched, Dr. Lysander's hand on my shoulder, as the woman pushed my bike across the threshold into the den. While you're here, Corey, it seems to me you should see what your job would entail, don't you agree? Ben and Johnny, they, they're going to miss me. Yes, they will, I'm sure. But they'll go in and sit down and watch the film, won't they? They'll probably think something happened, like things do to boys. He shrugged and his fingers began to knead my shoulder. My mom's going to be worried. I tried, but I knew it was no good. But she believes you're at the film, doesn't she? Now let's go downstairs and see what I'm prepared to pay you twenty dollars a week to do. My breath was stolen. Twenty dollars? Yes. Twenty dollars a week for an able and understanding apprentice seems like a bargain to me. Shall we go? His hand guided me toward the steps that led down. It was a powerful hand, and it would not be denied. I had to go. Dr. Lysander flicked a switch that turned on the light over the stairs and flooded light below me. As I descended, I heard the rustle of his red silk robe and the shuffle of his slippers on the stairs. I heard him slurp his coffee. It was a greedy sound. And I was afraid. My father had not taken Jacob Steiner and Lee Hannaford directly to the Union Pines Motel. On the way, jammed in the pickup truck with the wipers knocking away sleet, he'd asked them if they wanted some lunch. Both men had said yes, and that was how they'd wound up in a rear booth in the Bright Star Cafe. As Mr. Steiner slid into the booth and Dad sat down too, the younger man peeled off his jacket. He was wearing a blue checked shirt with the sleeves rolled up past his muscular biceps. And on the right bicep, there it was. Dad said, Oh, my God. Mr. Hannaford looked surprised. What is it? I'm not supposed to take my jacket off in here? A sheen of sweat had broken out on my father's forehead. Mr. Hannaford sat down beside Mr. Steiner. No, I, I, I mean, that tattoo. You got a problem with it, friend? The younger man's slate-colored eyes had narrowed into dangerous slits. Dad was having trouble breathing, and the room wanted to spin. No problem. It's just that uh, I've seen your tattoo before. The two men were silent. Mr. Steiner spoke first. May I ask where, Mr. Mackinson? Before I tell you, I want to know where you're from and why you're here. Dad pulled his gaze away from the faint outline of a skull with wings swept back from its temples. I wouldn't. We don't know this guy, Mr. Hannaford warned Mr. Steiner. True. We don't know anyone here, do we? Mr. Steiner glanced around, and Dad saw his hawk-like eyes take in the scene. A dozen or so people were having lunch and shooting the breeze. 
The television was tuned to a basketball game. How can we trust you, Mr. Mackinson? What's not to trust? Something about this man, the way he carried himself, the way his eyes were darting this way and that, sizing things up, made Dad ask the next question. Are you a policeman? By profession, no. But in a sense, yes, I am, in the field of historical research. Where are you from? Mr. Hannaford answered. I'm from Indiana. He's from... The older man interrupted him. Warsaw, Poland, originally. I live in Chicago now, and I can speak for myself, thank you. Both of you sure are a long way from home. Dad noticed the tattoo again. It looked as if the younger man had tried to bleach it out of his skin. Does that tattoo mean something? Lee Hannaford let smoke dribble from the corner of his mouth. It means that I don't like people asking me my business. Dad nodded. The first smolderings of anger were reddening his cheeks. Is that so? Well, what would you say to this, hot shot? Dad propped his elbows on the table and leaned his face closer to the young man's. What would you say if I told you that ten months ago I saw a tattoo just like yours on the arm of a dead man? Mr. Hannaford didn't respond. His face was emotionless, his eyes cold. He drew cigarette smoke in and blew it out. Did he have blonde hair? Kind of the same color as mine? Yep. About the same build, too? I think so, yes. Uh-huh. Mr. Hannaford leaned his chiseled face toward my father's. When he spoke, the words left smoke trails. I'd say you saw my brother. And these cages must be kept scrupulously clean, Dr. Lysander was saying as he pointed them out. They were empty right now. I followed along behind him as he showed me from room to room in the basement. Every once in a while I would glance up and see an air vent overhead. I order my hay in bales. You'd be expected to help unload the truck, cut the baling wire, and spread out hay for the horse stalls. I can attest that cutting baling wire is not an easy endeavor. It's tough enough to string a piano with. Plus, your job will include whatever errands I need you to run. He turned to face me. Twenty dollars a week for three afternoons. Say, from four until six. Does that sound fair? Gosh, I couldn't believe this. Dr. Lysander was offering me a fortune. He smiled, again with just his mouth. He drank his coffee and set the collie cup down atop an empty wire mesh cage. He spoke very softly. Corey, there is something we must clear up before I give you this job. I waited to hear it. He folded his arms across his chest, and I saw his tongue probe the inside of his cheek. It is a matter concerning Miss Sonia Glass. Sir? My heart, which had settled down some, now speeded up again. Miss Sonia Glass, he repeated. She brought her parrot to me. It died of a brain fever. Poor, poor creature. Now, it happens that Veronica and Miss Glass are in the same Sunday school class. Miss Glass, it seems, was terribly upset and puzzled by questions you asked her, Corey. She said you were very curious about a particular song, and why her parrot had reacted strangely to that song. He smiled thinly. Miss Glass told Veronica she thought you knew a secret, and might either Veronica or I know what it was? And there was some odd little thing as well about you being in the possession of a green feather from Miss Katerina Glass's dead parrot. Miss Sonia said she couldn't believe her eyes when she saw it. He began working the knuckles of his right hand as he stared at the floor. Are these things true, Corey? I swallowed hard. If I said they weren't, he'd know I was lying anyway. Yes, sir. He closed his eyes. A pained expression stole over his face. There, and then gone. And where did you find that green feather, Corey? I uh, found it. He 
Here was the moment of truth. I sensed something in that room coiled up like a snake and ready to strike. Though the overhead light was bright and harsh, the tile-floored room seemed to seethe with shadows. Dr. Lysander, I suddenly realized, had positioned himself between me and the stairs. He waited, his eyes closed. If I made a run for it, Mrs. Lysander would snare me even if I got past the doctor. Again, the choice was stolen from me. I braved the fates. I found it at Saxon's Lake, at the edge of the woods, before the sun, when that car went down with a dead man handcuffed to the wheel. With his eyes closed, Dr. Lysander smiled. It was a terrible sight. The flesh on his face looked tight and damp, his bald head shining under the light. Then he began to laugh, a slow leak of a laugh, bubbling from his silver-toothed mouth. His eyes opened, and they speared me. For a few seconds he had two faces. The lower one wore a silver-glinting smile. The upper one was pure fury. He shook his head as if he'd just heard the most amazing joke. <laughs> well, well, what are we going to do about this? Have you ever seen this man before, Mr. Mackinson? Mr. Steiner had removed his wallet. He had taken a laminated card from it, and now he slid the card before my father as they sat at the back booth in the Bright Star Cafe. It was a grainy black and white photograph. It showed a man wearing a white, knee-length coat, waving and smiling to someone off the frame. He had dark hair that swept back like a skull cap, and he had a square jaw and a cleft in his chin. Behind him was the hood of a gleaming car that looked like an antique, like from the thirties or forties. Dad studied the face for a moment. He paid close attention to the eyes and the white scar of a smile. For all his studying, however, it remained the face of a stranger. He slid the picture back across the wood. Nope, never. Mr. Steiner studied the picture, too, as if looking into the face of an old enemy. He'll probably look different now. He might have had some plastic surgery. The easiest way to change appearance is to grow a beard and shave your head. That way even your own mother wouldn't recognize you. I don't know that face. Sorry, who is he? His name is Gunther Down in the Dark. What? Dad almost chewed on his heart. Gunther down in the dark. D-A-H-N-I-N-A-D-E-R-K-E. -E. Down in the dark. Dad sat back in the booth, his mouth open. He gripped the table's edge to keep from being spun off the entire world. His voice was a whisper. My God. My God. Come with me. Down in a deck. Excuse me? Mr. Steiner asked. Who is he? Dad's voice was thick. Lee Hannaford answered. He's the man who killed Jeff if my brother's body is lying at the bottom of that damn lake. Dad had told them the story of that morning last March. My brother, my stupid-ass brother, must have been blackmailing him by what we can figure out. Jeff left a diary hidden in his apartment back in Fort Wayne. It was in code, written in German. I found the diary in May when I quit my job in California and came looking for him. It took us until a couple of weeks ago to figure the code out. <laughs> he was always nuts about that code shit, even as a kid. It was down in the book that Dan and a Dirk lived in Zephyr, Alabama, under a false name, I mean. Jeff and those scumbags helped him come up with a new identity after he got in touch with him, but Jeff must have decided he wanted a payoff for his trouble. In the diary, he said he was going to make a big score, get his stuff out of the apartment, and move to Florida. He said he was driving down to Zephyr from Fort Wayne on the 13th of March, and that was the last entry. He shook his head. My brother was fucking crazy to get involved in this. Well, I was crazy for getting involved in it, too. Mr. Steiner saw the puzzled look on my dad's face and explained, Lee and his brother were members of an American Nazi organization that operated in Indiana, Illinois, and Michigan. The symbol of that organization is the tattoo on Lee's arm. 
Lee and Jeff were initiated at the same time, but Lee left the group after a year and went to California. Damn straight. A match flared, and a lucky burned. I wanted to get as far away from those bastards as I could. They kill people who decide Hitler didn't shit roses. But your brother stayed with them? Hell yes. He even got to be some kind of stormtrooper leader or something. Jesus, can you believe it? We were all Americans on our high school football team. I still don't know who this uh, Gunther Dan in the Dirk fella is, Dad said. Mr. Steiner laced his fingers atop the table. This is where I come in. Lee took the diary to be deciphered by the Department of Languages at Indiana University. A friend of mine there teaches German. When he got as far as deciphering Dan and Dirk's name from that code, he sent the diary directly to me at Northwestern in Chicago. I took over the project from there in September. Perhaps I should explain that I am the director of the Languages Department. I am also professor of history. And last, but not least, I am a hunter of Nazi war criminals. War criminals? This guy's a war criminal? What'd he do? Dr. Gunther Dannenedecker was the directing physician at Erstwegen concentration camp in Holland. He and his wife Kara determined who was fit to work and who was ready to be gassed. Mr. Steiner flashed a quick and chilling smile. It was they, you see, who decided on a sunny morning that I was still fit to live. But my wife was not. I'm sorry, Dad said. That's all right. I knocked his front tooth out and spent a year at hard labor, but it made me hard and kept me alive. You knocked his front tooth right out of his head. Oh, those two were quite a pair. Mr. Steiner's face crinkled with the memory of pain. We called his wife the bird lady because she had a set of twelve birds made from clay mixed with the ash of human bones. And Dr. Daninadarka, who was originally a veterinarian from Rotterdam, had a very intriguing habit. As the prisoners passed him on their way to the gas chamber, he made up names for them. Comical names, they were. I'll always remember what he called my Veronica. My beautiful Veronica with the long golden hair. He called her Sunbeam. He said, Crawl right in, Sunbeam. Crawl right in. And she was so sick, she had to crawl through her own. Tears welled up behind his glasses. He took them quickly off with the manner of a man who rigidly controlled his emotions. Forgive me. Sometimes I forget myself. Dad took a long breath. Let me... Let me see that picture again. Mr. Steiner slid it in front of him. Dad shook his head. Oh, no. Oh, please, no. Mr. Steiner had heard it in Dad's voice. You know him now. Dad stood up. I'll take you to him. Such a bright young man, Dr. Lysander said, standing between me and the way out. There's that terrier determination, isn't it? Finding that green feather and pursuing it to the end. I admire that, Corey. I truly do. He took two steps toward me. I retreated as many. I heard Mrs. Lysander's footsteps heavy on the floor above. Then, a scraping sound, and a few seconds later, the piano being played. The tune was Beautiful Dreamer. Mrs. Lysander was actually a very talented pianist. She had the hands for it, I recalled Miss Blue Glass saying. I wondered if she also had the hands that were strong enough to wrap hay baling wire around a man's throat and strangle him to death. Or had Dr. Lysander done that, as Mrs. Lysander played that same tune in the den above, and the parrots had squawked and screamed with the memory of brutal violence? The front doorbell rang. Beautiful Dreamer abruptly stopped. I heard the scrape again, the piano bench being pushed back. We heard the front door opening. 
and Mrs. Lysander's voice. Tom, what may I do for you? Dad, help! I shouted. Dr. Lysander's hand clamped over my mouth. Dad yelled, Corey, get out of my way, you... Dad started into the house, with Mr. Steiner and Lee Hannaford behind him. He shoved the big woman aside, but in the next instant, Mrs. Lysander bellowed, Nine! and slammed a forearm across the side of his face. He fell backward into Mr. Steiner, blood trickling from a gashed eyebrow. Only Mr. Steiner could understand the things Mrs. Lysander shouted to her husband. Gunther, run! Take the boy and run! As she was shouting, Mr. Hannaford grabbed her around her throat from behind, and with all his weight and strength he wrestled her to the floor. She got up on one knee and fought back. But suddenly Mr. Steiner was on her too, trying to pin her flailing arms and yelling, It's over, Cara. It's over. Over. But it was not over for her husband. At her warning cry, he had picked me up with one arm, vaulted up the steps, and scooped the car keys off the kitchen counter where his wife had left them. As I thrashed to get free, he dragged me out the back door into the falling sleet, the wind whipping his red silk robe. He flung me into the Buick, slammed the door almost on my leg, and leaped behind the wheel. He jammed the key into the ignition, turned it, and the engine roared to life. The Buick's engine screamed as the car tore away. Behind us, my father was already running back through the house to get to the pickup. He jumped over the struggling bodies of Mr. Steiner, Mr. Hannaford, and Kara Daninadek. Dr. Lysander was racing through the streets of Zephyr, the Buick's tires shrieking at every turn. I started to crawl up from the floorboard, but Dr. Lysander shouted, Stay there! Don't you move, you little bastard! And he slapped me in the face, and I slid back down again. We must have passed the lyric. I wondered how much hell a hero could stand. We roared onto the gargoyle bridge, sideswiped the left side of it, and headed onto Route 10. I saw light leap from the rearview mirror and stab Dr. Lysander in the eyes. He shouted a curse in German that was louder than the Buick's wail, and I could just imagine what the parrots had had to endure that night. But I knew whose lights those were, ricocheting off the mirror. I knew who was right behind us, right on the Buick's tail, pushing that old pickup truck to its point of explosion. I pulled myself up on the seat and looked back at my father's pickup, twenty feet of sleet and air between Dad's front bumper and Dr. Lysander's rear bumper. I heard a pop and twisted my head in time to see Dr. Lysander reaching into the glove compartment, which he'd knocked open with a blow of his fist. His hand emerged, gripping a snub-nosed thirty-eight pistol. He threw that arm back, almost cuffing me in the head with the gun's barrel before I ducked, and he fired twice without aiming. The rear windshield exploded, the glass fragments flying toward Dad's pickup like pieces of jagged ice. I saw the pickup swerve and almost go off the road, its rear end wildly fishtailing, but then Dad got it righted. As Dr. Lysander's gun hand passed over my head again, I reached up and grabbed his wrist, pinning that gun against the seat with all my strength. The Buick began to slew from side to side as he grappled with the wheel and with me at the same time, but I hung on. Then he gave his arm a sudden, violent jerk, pulling the gun out from under me. The gun went off in front of my face as he pulled it free. The bullet slammed off the Buick's heavy metal dashboard with a metallic clang, followed immediately by a heavy thunk. Dr. Lysander grunted, gasped, and lurched forward. The gun bounced to the floor as he grabbed the wheel with both hands. The car careened across the road. I saw that we were about to pass the dark plain of Saxon's Lake. Dr. Lysander tried to jam on the brakes, but his foot missed the pedal. We bounced off a rock, then a tree. Dr. Lysander came tumbling into me across the seat, and my breath burst out, my ribs in danger of snapping. His face was pressed against mine, his weight crushing me, and I smelled his fear like green onions. Then he screamed, and I think I screamed too, because suddenly the car was falling. We hit with a bone-jarring jolt and splash. Dark water seethed up into the floorboard. We had just been received by Saxon's Lake. The Buick's steaming hood was rising. As it did, water began to surge over the slope of the trunk and pour through the shattered glass. The window on Dr. Lysander's side was broken as well, but the water hadn't yet reached it. He was lying on top of me, the gun lost. His eyes were glassy. Blood stained the left side of his pajama top and robe, and his breath was rasping. I couldn't get Dr. Lysander off me. 
And now the car was slowly turning against me as the Buick rolled over like a happy hog and my side started to submerge. Dr. Lysander was drooling bloody foam. Corey! Corey! I looked up, past Dr. Lysander, to the broken window rising above me. My father was there, his hair plastered flat, his face dripping. Blood was creeping down from his cut eyebrow. He started wrenching bits of glass from the window frame with his fingers. The Buick shuddered and moaned. Water edged up over the seat, and its cold touch shocked me and made Dr. Lysander start thrashing. Can you grab my hand? Dad wedged his body in through the crumpled window and strained to reach me. I couldn't, not with that weight on me. Help me, Dad! He fought to winnow in farther. His sides must have been raked and clawed by glass, but his face showed no pain. His lips were tight and grim, his eyes fixed on me like red-rimmed lamps. His hand tried to part the distance between us, but still the distance was too great. Dr. Lysander's body lurched. Water sloshed over us a touch of the grave. He made a deep, moaning noise. Get off him, Dad shouted. For God's sake, get off my son! Dr. Lysander shuddered and coughed. On the third cough, bright red blood sprayed from his nose and mouth. He grasped at his side, and suddenly there was blood on his hand. The water was roaring now. The Buick was sinking at the trunk. Please, Dad begged, still straining to reach me. Please give me my son. Dr. Lysander looked around as if trying to figure out exactly where he was. He looked back at the sinking trunk and the water surging dark and foamy where the rear windshield had been, and I heard him whisper, Oh. It was the whisper of surrender. Dr. Lysander's face turned. He stared at me. Blood dripped from his nose and ran down my cheek. Corey, he said, and his voice gurgled. His hand closed on my wrist. You go, Bronco. He lifted himself up with an effort that must have racked him, and he guided my hand into my father's. Dad pulled me out, and I flung my arms around his neck. He held me, his legs treading water and tears streaming down his heroic face. With a great buckling and moaning noise, the Buick was going down. The water rushed around us, drawing us in. Dad started kicking us away from it, but the pull was too strong. Then, with a hissing noise of heat and liquid at war, the Buick was drawn down into the depths. I felt my father fighting the suction, and then he gasped a breath, and I knew he had lost. We went under. The car was sinking below us into a huge, gloomy vault where the sun was a stranger. Air bubbles rose from it like silver jellyfish. Dad was kicking frantically, trying to break the pull. But we were going down with Dr. Lysander. In the underwater blur, I saw the doctor's white face pressed up against the windshield. Bubbles were streaming from his open mouth. And suddenly, something had drifted up from below and was clinging to the trunk. Something that might have been a big clump of moss or rags somebody had dumped into Saxon's lake with their garbage. Whatever this thing was, it moved slowly and inexorably into the Buick through the broken rear windshield. The car was turning, turning over like a bizarre carnival ride suspended against darkness. As my lungs burned for breath, I saw the blur of Dr. Lysander's white face again, only this time. The ragged, mossy thing had wrapped itself around him like a putrid robe. Whatever this thing was, it had hold of his jaw. I saw a faint glint of a silver tooth, like a receding star. Then the Buick turned over on its back like a huge turtle, and as air bubbles rushed up again, I felt them hit us and break us loose from the suction. We were rising toward the realm of light. Dad lifted me up, so my head broke the surface first. There wasn't much light up there, but there was a whole lot of air. Dad and I clung together in the choppy murk, 
breathing. At last we swam to where we could pull ourselves out, through mud and reeds to solid earth. Dad sat down on the ground next to the pickup truck, his hands scraped raw with glass cuts, and I huddled on the red rock cliff and looked out over Saxon's lake. Dad said, Hey, partner. You okay? Yes, sir. My teeth were chattering, but being cold was a passing thing. Better get in the truck. I will, I answered. But I wasn't ready yet. Dad pulled his knees up to his chest. The sleet was falling. But we were already cold and wet, so what of it? Dad looked up at the low gray clouds. He smiled, with the face of a boy unburdened. I've got a story to tell you about Dr. Lysander, he said. I want to tell you one, too, I answered. I listened. The wind swept over the lake's surface and made it whisper. He was down in the dark now. He had come from darkness. And to darkness, he had returned. Boy's Life was written by Robert McCammon and read by Richard Thomas. It was a bridge for audio by Jesse Boggs. The recording engineer was Stephen Strassman. The associate producer was Linda Woolman, and the director was Christy Logan. Boy's Life was produced by Susan Perrin. <laughs>